we're live. Good morning, Nubians. Good morning. Uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening, because it's a lot of Nubians are coming from other places in the world and it's different times. Good global um, greeting. That's yes, it. and good morning to you, sir. We are exclusively live right now in Nubia. And for those of you who are watching this in YouTube, uh, you uh, you should join Nubia. Come on to Nubia. It's a serious <laughs> thing. It's, look, it was built for such a time as this and such oh. a topic as this. <laughs> Yeah. So yesterday, um, I, you know, I, I have a radio show on Sirius XM and, and we start off the show with Drew McCaskill, who's a Morehouse grad, yes. talking about, um, you know, the Blackburn takeover. And, you know, I'm like, this isn't the first, second, third, fourth. You know, there's been issues, not just at Howard, but, you know, Hampton. More, he was sharing some things that happened at Morehouse and Spelman and you know, I was, I was talking about the video the young lady shared with the mold yes. uh, behind her mirror and her luggage and in her food area. And, you know, I was disgusted to see um, and we know the Wi-Fi issues, a uh, couple of you know, was ransomware and uh, the students couldn't even go to class a couple of weeks ago. And there's still Wi-Fi issues. And I'm like one hundred and forty million dollars in six months last uh, this year. Yeah. Wow. And and not to mention the George Floyd summer money and the McKenzie Scott. Money. But, you know, I'm like. Every child should get a a, a hot box like this. I'm, I'm about to share this with. Uh, share this. Yeah. You know, you could plug it into the Ethernet and yeah, get every yeah, what, 9,600 students. Everybody can get one with one hundred forty million dollars. It doesn't even cost a million dollars. An individual, an individual. Although the, the kids tell me that they have been distributed. Uh, hot spots they have to check them out i'm not quite sure it's the full process but uh yeah the the, the cyber attack crippled an infrastructure that was already um you know, i mean all the all the infrastructures are obviously vulnerable some more vulnerable than others but yeah we haven't quite clawed our back way back from that yet but uh the hot spots are apparently one factor that are in operation in this kind of field of rapid well in field of response but 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 your larger point is the point. In fact, the, a lot of the questions, not only at Howard, but increasingly, I mean, over the arc of years in terms of HBCUs is where does the money go? And for students, you know, the PR is obviously there in terms of donations, in terms of grant. But for their mom and them, they daddy and them is that I know the check I wrote. Right, right. So well, the like, well, the money the earmarked. I was like, no, I know Mackenzie Scott's forty million. Said you do whatever you want with it. I know that. I read the stories on the air, and I was sensitive. Oh, did to you? Oh, well, I mean, you know, I hadn't talked about it. Yeah. In deference to you, more importantly, you know, no, I don't. I mean, no, but I'm just saying, I'm mindful of the relationship that I actually have with you know uh dr frederick absolutely on absolutely on my show a lot so i was like mm, yeah tuesday i'm not I ain't talking about it wednesday i'm not talking about it. But by friday i'm like i gotta talk about it and then the lines lit up with parents calling oh. it and you know and, and they were you know and they're so respectful because they what you know one one lady uh one woman called up and she said you know I, my baby you know we my husband and i didn't go to hbcu but my baby wanted to go to howard hmm. so we made sure you know we dropped her off and it has been uh, nothing that I expected, not in a good way. Um, and, you know, they talked about the fees. They saved up all their money to because it's out of state, you know, and it's a private school, so it costs more. And then there's like fees for this and fees for that and all these hidden fees. And it was like, that was, you know, so what are we paying for? Another lady called up in tears because they said, you know, her daughter couldn't get housing, freshman. So they're paying $2,600 a month. For an apartment, you know, DC. Oh, yeah. no, I can't. <laughs> she yeah, she started, you know, just outside of DC. And, it's and, not, you it's know, not affordable. It's right. It's, no. And she said to see what's happening now and then to get her daughter, you know, and for parents to save up to send their children anywhere is a sacrifice, you know. Um, you, you ex imagine we're in a pandemic, so you, you know, it's going to be some trouble, but the things that are avoidable. And so we started having this conversation about you know, our expectations and, and how we hold one another accountable. And it's a social structure versus governance structure conversation that we were having. So we're, I'm like, I'm having a governance structure conversation. So I don't need to hear from nobody outside of the community. How about we, need to, we need to start talking about, you know, how we hold people accountable, because I think we give people a pass because we don't want folk to come for them. And we don't want to diminish, you know, the progress. And we don't, but and so Drew was like, how are we having these conversations? I had this conversation 30 years ago. <laughs> well, as, you know, as did I. 
These yeah. are conversations being had in my house 30 years ago. That's right. And they're still being had. And back then it was money. Okay, we didn't have the funding. And yes, the endowments at Howard, which has the most, a tenth of what you get at Harvard. Well, not it's a tenth not of, even, that's right. That's right. right. But it's, it, it's a smaller student body. You have more community involvement. I mean, I just feel like they could do better. So I'm just going to throw it out there. You work there. I don't know, you know, with all the superstars that have come and you're a rock star, you know, no. you got Hannah, you know, you got, no, no, no. I made, Hathi, I, you got, you got, I made you know, a generational, you generational choice to avoid, uh, as Elijah Muhammad would say, avoid them bright lights. Cause you know, I'm, bo we're born, we die in between. We get to make choices and rightly or wrongly a very deliberate choice I made. And I'm not alone. There are a lot of HBCU faculty that do that is not to get caught in that type of, of you want to minimize your minimize the risk that you'll get distracted in fact there's a brand new little pamphlet called virtue hoarders Catherine Liu it's very interesting the case against what she calls the PMC the professional managerial class and what she's saying is that these are people who while well-intentioned have translated the idea of uh kind of social justice movements and actions into a form of performative identity and virtue signaling. So, you know, the idea of doing ordinary things, organizing and talking and discussing, get converted into a kind of talking about it and almost creating this kind of this hierarchy, this almost superiority complex. And she says it stands in the way of social justice. It stands in the way of uh, economic redistribution, redistribution because it promotes this meritocracy. It promotes a, a promotes a philanthropy based notion like we need help kind of notion. And it also is very self-serving. So when you're an academic and we're both academics, we know that there is a star culture in white institutions in particular that kind of curates pets. And, you know, what the pet is saying is less important than the fact that, that, they, that they are pets. In fact, the more. Uh, quote unquote radical the pet is sometimes the, the better prestige the university can uh, claim, particularly when it's not moving the university one bit. It's a form of virtue signaling. So, so, so in fact, those kind of institutions become virtue hoarders in a sense. That's what Lee was talking about. So, so those of us who are HBCUs, ain't a lot of glamour in going to class and teaching your students. But if that's your objective, it is the best thing in the world. We know that. So um, last week we talked talked about Fannie Lou Hamer and, mm -hmm. and listening to her own account of her arrest and what happened to her in the jail. She, she said, then they brought in two, two Negroes to beat her, right? Yes. She talked about that. Two and inmates. I, two inmates. Yeah. To uh, exact the punishment. That's right. And I think about the founding of many of the HBCUs and then to put black people in charge, mm. to carry out. The mission. So, um, and with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna back up because no, 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 don't, don't, please don't, because I think this is and this is this is so important. When we, first of all, we've had those uh in in the Nubia family and in the narrative family, and those who have been watching us in the wide open, uh, classroom of YouTube, know that as we approach our mid 80s, this is 84, isn't it? We're 84. I think we have talked about historically black colleges and universities several times including a couple of times in depth in depth rather in in depth and we've talked about black education and while we've done it um a couple of times in depth we can never do it enough because the question of black education in the western hemisphere particularly in the united states i'll, I'll restrict to the united states um, the question of black education in the United States is an unre there's an unresolved tension at the heart of that that practice, because what you really have is um, black folk who are attempting under perpetual violence, under perpetual asymmetrical assault from a social structure that is literally built on their blood, on their backs to define and decide for themselves who we are what we want for ourselves and our children. And so it's a constant tension. It was never settled because we were brought into the field of violence. And just so like those two uh, African men, men of African descent, who were called upon to assault, to beat Fannie Lou Hamer, 
within an inch of her life, if it had been their choice, we can only imagine and expect that they would not have done that. However, the field of violence required them to do it at the risk of their own lives. Now, we would all like to imagine that we would have chosen not to do it and suffered the consequences. But the simple fact of reality is that probably more often than not, people of any background subjected to the field of violence that they were subjected to would have made the choice that they made, which was not to resist. In fact, we, we, we will never know whether Fannie Lou Townsend Hamer would have been killed if they had indeed beaten her until they were tired. There may have even been a pantomime of sorts, but we don't, we just don't know. But what we do know is they all three of those Africans were operating in a field of violence and every institution that black people have either created or that has been created with the idea they were, that somebody externally was going to shape black people in mind as it relates to education has been created in a field of violence in a field of settler colonialism, white supremacy, now neoliberalism, capitalism, and that black people attempting to define ourselves and define what we want while we're trying to build a we at the same time with every passing year farther and farther away from the one common denominator that created the idea of a black community in the first place, namely enslavement. While that's going on, there are perpetual assaults there's a perpetual tension. And so what, what I'm listening to you, what you did yesterday, it seems to me the conversation you and Drew had and then opening up the line so we could hear that governance conversation is really fundamental to why, you know, you said, you know what, let's press record this year and almost two years ago. Well, it won't be two years soon, but two, a year and a half ago. And then slowly building narrative, building Nubia. Because as I told uh, somebody the other day, Standing in the parking lot after the sun had gone down, that March day after I had my last class and a class in which I came into that morning class at 8 a.m. and said to them, we're going on spring break next week. I don't expect to see you all physically again um, for some time. And they were like, no, Dr. Carr, we got alternative spring break. We're going out. We're going to go serve. And I said, OK. I didn't, you know, I'm not going to argue with young people because I don't want to diminish their hope. And hey, who knows? But, you know, I, I kind of I read a lot of yeah, I kind of pay attention. I know that they, you know, OK, I understand. So I just quietly set up my iPhone on a makeshift little you know, stack of books. And then they put it here. I said, oh, I'm just going to tape this and make a YouTube channel anyway and send this out. We're going to go through the semester's work to date in these slides. And uh, and I guess, you know, I'll see you all in a couple of weeks or not. But will be will be secure and of course that was the last time i have taught my introduction to african studies class in person and i remember going and of course within a couple of days the word came down we weren't coming back and and, and so you know i went to my friends at sankofa they uploaded all my classes i went on to take more classes i uploaded them to the youtube channel that's before we had uh, what we have now here, because now we have the literally the largest Africana studies class, the largest Africana studies formation in the world. And but when the classes are loaded into narrative, we will have that course of study with curriculum, with assessments that people want to do. I mean, it's all there. But this is the point I'm, make, I'm about to make that night because, you know, my first class is at 8, 10 in the morning. My last class is usually 340 to 5. I'm out at 5. So I'm standing in the parking lot. No, that's not true. Freshman seminar, we get out at seven. But I'm standing in the parking lot at the car. I made a little video. I said, you know what? We're going to jailbreak the black university. Because, see, higher education is an unsustainable model. The only way it can be sustained now is that different kinds of decisions have to be made. And, and, and in a neoliberal model, see a neoliberal model, and we won't get into the, 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 the weeds of neoliberalism, but the simple fact of the matter is a neoliberal perspective someone has will say, you know, let's let the market choose winners and losers. Let's get government out of picking ec economic winners and losers. In fact, let's let all the mechanisms move into the business world, into the commercial world, into the economic world, private actors, and, and people just get out here and, you know, you eat what you kill. And they want to apply that to everybody. Now, that's not going to work with higher education. And we'll talk more about that in a second as it relates to HBCUs in general. Howard giving us a point of entry with this Blackburn takeover uh, moment. 
Uh, and for those of you who don't know, the hashtag Blackburn Takeover apply, uh, it refers to a student action which began earlier uh, this week on Tuesday when students attending uh, a student meeting led by student elected representatives at Howard student government uh, convened to discuss ongoing challenges at Howard, some that are unique to Howard and others that are not unique to any higher education institution and others that are in between that are not unique to HBCUs. However, um, members of the administration, the upper administration, including the president of the university had been invited to the meeting. And when there were no administration, administration representatives there, uh, according to the students who were present and the narrative that they have uh, shared with the world now, because, you know, I, I uh, actually went to campus uh, Friday evening just to walk over to the student center to see, because, you know, those young people are our responsibility. And I mean, every adult, um, we love our children. We have to, we have to support our young people. And when it comes to our people, many of us made the deliberate choice to work at historically black colleges and universities because those are nieces and nephews, you know, those are sons and daughters. People often talk about being a, a son or a daughter of, of, of daughter of Spellman, a son of a Morehouse man, a, you know, a, a son or daughter of Howard. And I always remind folk, I said, well, if you all are the sons and daughters of Howard, who are your parents? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You didn't convene yourself into yourself and no administrator taught a class that you took unless they're also teachers. And as a teacher, I take that responsibility very seriously. So I went over and I stood and watched. I didn't stop anybody. You know, I had my mask on. So, you know, it allows me to kind of travel in a little bit of anonymity long on over my mouth. So I'm sitting there watching very well organized. They have uh, tents up. I'm talking about those pup tent, like those, those kind of modern tents you cast. They're in there on their laptops. I see them doing homework. I'm listening to the conversations. They've got different stations. They got toiletries on several tables here stacked up high. They got medical supplies, medicines. Uh, they have, you know, all kind of food. I'm watching people bringing food. I'm seeing convoys of food coming in. I went to the door there just to look in, you know, and um, I know that several students who are in my classes are in there, but I don't know that from communicating with them outside of class. I know that because when I went into class on Zoom last week, I asked on Thursday, I said, are any of you all in the building? And several of them in the chat put, yeah, we're in there. I said, okay, y'all be safe. And in the foyer, there were several members of the Howard University Police Force. Well, let's be very clear. Uh, they are police. That is, that, is their, that is their paid role. However, several of those brothers, I didn't see any uh, women there, but that's not to say they weren't sisters because they are sisters on Howard Police Force. But several of those brothers I've known just about since I came to Howard. And I've had long conversations with them at all time of the day and night and every day you can imagine and in every possible circumstances, including some very difficult circumstances. I remember when Laura Bush was on campus for a conference and her husband decided he was going to sneak up there to surprise her. And he was in that very same Blackburn Center. And this was during the Iraq war. And those Howard students went off because, of course, they had uh, closed off the entire Blackburn Center and the Secret Service SUVs were um were um were, were lined up in front of, of 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 Blackburn, and you could see the snipers. You could see the guys with the you know, white boys with the finger on the trigger, with the buzz haircuts. And the president of Howard University at the time, Pat Swire, came out of the building, out of Blackburn, and I was out there in the yard because I, I it was it was it was thousands of students out there, and I'm like, y'all don't go across that street. And I was trying to get them to kind of back up off that building because they, look, they looking for an excuse to shoot y'all, and I'll never forget that. My friend, Pat Swigert, the president of Howard University at the time, uh, saw me, came to me and was like, help me get them to the flagpole, at least turn them in that direction. Because his thing is, these are our, these are our children. You understand? I said, Mr. President, come on, let's go. I said, put your hand in my back. And me and him walked, got through the crowd, got to the flagpole and said, everybody, can y'all? And they started to turn that way. And we were like, y'all, this is your campus. They're visitors. But understand this, this is a this is a fluid situation and we give them no excuse. And those young people had a spontaneous anti-war rally with the war criminal, George W. Uh, George W. Bush in the Blackburn Center. He snuck out like who he is, a thief then and a thief now. But my point is that, you know, that was a very fluid situation. I'm just making that point to make the point that we are responsible for our young people. 
I went to an HBCU. I was a student body president. We did student takeovers. My brother, my second year of law school, he called me from inside the president's office of Tennessee State. They had taken over the building. It's one of the most famous protests in the 1980s. It's 1989. I'm in the black law student's office on the phone with them from the... That was this. That was in the wake of things we had done. We took over. We had done so much turning up that the governor of Tennessee can't asked me to come, and I'm sitting in his office. This is after we had had protests, and before when he was running in the primary, we endorsed him on the strength of the promise that we would get money owed Tennessee State. There are buildings on the campus right now that that, that speak to that student movement. And I'm saying all that to say this just very quickly: when we have responsibility. And I learned at a very young age. I mean, I was a uh, student body president. I was 21, but I was sophomore class president of Tennessee State. So I was 19 years old when I did my first student protest. Tony Spratlin from Memphis, Tennessee was student body president. We walked to the United, to the United States, to Tennessee State Capitol, protesting the desegregation order. It's a whole nother thing. But my point is that I'll never forget meeting with faculty. I'll never forget meeting, not administrators, faculty. And I'll never forget faculty saying we have our own issues and they're part of the same issues you all have and we must be in solidarity but what we cannot ever do is tell y'all what to do and i never forgot those conversations and in the i guess what 19 years old in the 36 37 years since then having gradu been graduated from Tennessee State, having gotten a law degree and a master's degree from Ohio State, a white school where we did the same. Oh, man, I, I, we took over. I mean, we, we created a bit uh, after the day of the Rodney King verdict. We marched to the administration building with a list of demands because we set we set up. I stayed up all night. I was a graduate graduate assistant at the Frank Hale Black Culture Center. Shout out to my man, Larry Williamson, director to this day. And we watched on the big screen TV, all the black students, you know, how I say that time have about 50,000 students, maybe 10 percent black. Most of them graduate professional students. They were hell on the undergrads. And so as many just came and watched this thing go down that next morning, we marched to the administration building with a list of demands we had developed overnight. Somebody snatched the American flag down the flagpole, burn it on the ground. We we tacked them things on the president's door. Gordon Gee, who to this day remains a friend of mine. He's now the president of the University of West Virginia. Spent many years at Vanderbilt before that he was president of Ohio State. I'm bringing all this up to say that that set off a negotiation process that led us by the end of that seven day period to create something called Africans Committed to Improving Our Nation. Africa action. We said any black person at Ohio State. The black women who got to clean up the vomit and all the kind of stuff in these white fraternity and sorority houses on Monday morning after a weekend of carousing. The brothers and sisters who cut the grass and trim the hedges, all of the faculty, administrators and all the students, especially undergraduate students who we as law students used to go over and defend because they would get into beefs with their roommates and they try to put them out of school. Everybody on here got to be protected. But I remember faculty, Mwanza Ross being one, William Nelson being the other, others. I mean, I'm just thinking about black faculty who've been there for years, who told us the story of the 60s and 70s and 80s rebellions. And here we are in 1991 and 1992. And they say to us, we are with you, but we cannot tell you what to do. We will share our experiences, but we, we're not. This is a moment when you have to lead. I feel the same way about those students at Howard. So I went over there yesterday to check on them and I talked to the police. I knew I know these guys and I'm like, y'all doing OK? Yeah, man. I said, they all right. Yeah, they all right. You know, we ain't gonna let them have them. I said, I know you're not. This is you're exactly right. This is a governance structure conversation. It's a very different conversation. And I'm saying I have to say that when I stood in that parking lot, the last day we had physical class at Howard in March 2000. And I made that little video. We're going to jailbreak the black university. 2020. 2020. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the days. You know what's so beautiful about it? Time. And we're going to talk about it in a minute. I'm going to talk okay. about this cat, Larry Morris, who's the chair of Howard's Board of Trustees, with a book that I've mentioned before. Like I said, we've had this conversation before, but I'm thinking to myself, it's called Sundial. Uh, I'm thinking to myself, I wish all the students who are now involved in this black, in this Blackburn, uh, in this Blackburn takeover, in fact, HBCU students would read. The current chair of Howard University's Board of Trustees read his novel Sundial, which is written about the student movement. Wow. The late 1968, 69. I'm going to read from it in a minute because what you'll see is and his basic thesis is this is a cycle. But this is the same guy 
who has who is the face of the board's decision to eliminate student trustees, uh, graduate and professional student trustees, graduate professional faculty trustees, alumni trustees, and say that it's in, in the interest of creating more transparency and more engagement. And I have no doubt in my mind he believes that, even as I have no doubt in my mind that it is a fundamentally wrong choice. But the thing is, within the governance structure, we have to have the ability to have that conversation. Right. So, and so, so what uh, yeah. we're going to because we are live in Nubia, people have questions. So I'm going to, you know, feel that. What's the what what's the Blackburn takeover about? What are they? What are they? Pro uh, I saw a lot of videos. Yes. What are the fundamental issues that they want to see changed besides the mold and the physical? Somebody said, who's doing the maintenance there? They should be fired immediately, of course. Um, but they're not. So like what what are the major issues that these these young people want to see changed? Well, <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> let me pause here. Completely unrelated. But since I said it that way and I was thinking about it, it put me in mind of a brother who. And I know you'll appreciate this. At, um, I hope that I hope I hope Johnny B. Baker gets a ring this fall my man dusty baker <laughs> i haven't been to a washington nationals game since they fired him but anyway every time they ask dusty baker a question at the press conference his first word is invariably well <laughs> dusty what about you say well <laughs> so <laughs> i mean you can see it so well what they're fighting for i think about my ancestor the great hannibal tyreek tyreek uh, who was a great educator out of Chicago and one of the leaders of the Council of Independent Black Institutions. We were in the Sea Islands in 1996 for a CB conference, and I had just finished speaking. They'd asked me to come down and give a talk about African-centered education. And he got up afterwards, this elder, and Hannibal Tyreek, Baba Hannibal said, what we are demanding is right. What they're demanding is right. Howard has housed um, an overwhelming number of students, but there are other students who are housing challenged, some who are unhoused, sleeping in cars. And so the question becomes, how many of those can be tolerated? This isn't a matter of rounding error. This is a matter of human beings and other people's children, which means our children. So they're asking for housing security. There are issues of contamination in the dormitories. And, you know, administration would say some of the rooms, and that's been addressed, but see, the problem is now that, of course, when we think about, and again, this is why the Africana Studies framework is so important. Think about our science and technology category. When we ask, how did or do African people in the period we are studying either create or adapt or use existing technology or science? Well, of course, we're living in a period now that's different even in 2018 when there was the last student takeover or 1989 when there was a major student takeover at Howard or 1968 when there was a major student takeover at Howard or the 1920s when they were major takeovers. They now have the capacity to ignore, overrun, subsume, and then eventually shift the attention of legacy media. So for the last several months, whether it be TikTok, whether it be Twitter, whether it be Instagram, and you know, I'm not on um, I only have a Twitter account and now, of course, Nubia as we shift here. But, you know, listening to students in class, primarily listening to them talk about posting these TikTok videos. And then on the occasion that I will see them, because I do go to campus. I mean, obviously, I mean, I would like for us to be in person, but, you know, I'll say, yeah, I'm on TikTok. And they'll show me their account. I'm like, whoa, whoa wait a minute. Hold on. Good Lord. And then and then let's see. It's, it's critical to listen. We have to listen to each other. And the stories I've heard, whether it be uh, security, in other words, you know, even the campus perimeter being difficult to secure. And remember now on the campus, on our campuses around the country, and I'm talking now about our HBCU campuses, not the HPCU campuses, uh, not the historically plantation colleges and universities, <laughs> uh, which have been out of control since uh, last spring. So I'm not talking about the super spreader events at the University of Florida or the unregulated crowds running uh, jammed up shoulder to shoulder in these hundred thousand uh, seat stadiums to watch black women, black men engage in gladiator games in the uh, slave economic concern, also known as the SEC or its counterparts, the Big Ten, the Big Twelve. No, I'm talking about black children at HBCU campuses uh, who 
like like their counterparts, regardless of background, regardless of university, comprise right now as we sit here in October, comprise two classes of in-person freshmen. It doesn't matter that one of those classes has over 30 credit hours, which means they are sophomores in terms of academic. You've got two years of teenagers who have never been away from home <laughs> now on all these campuses. And when you do that in black, you can imagine the intensity of the desire to engage. Mm -hmm. And so when you are engaged in that type, have that kind of energy without the steady and constant presence of the adults, people like me who spend much more time than any of my colleagues who made different kind of choices would ever think is why I'm spending on a college campus because my time isn't just in the classroom. My time isn't just in my office. My time, most of my time, there are many days I never made it to my office. Why? Because when I get out of class, I'm surrounded by students and I just put all my bags and books down. You know, my back then healed up in the last two years because, you know, I'll I be carrying a lot of books with me all the time. right? So I put down the books out in front of Lock Hall, sit on the bench and for two hours, hold court. They just come say, we ain't have all, I mean, going to the office for office hours, we're just going to sit here. And then people get in the rhythm. And before, so I'm saying all that to say that those adults aren't there in the same way. So what you have is an alchemy of sorts. This is unprecedented. Think, and I'm going to use an extreme example to make this point. Think a perpetual spring break with the potential on the extreme end, which we hope would never happen, of Lord of the Rings. In other words, <laughs> I mean, yeah, Lord, Lord of the, of the Flies. Lord of the Flies, not Lord yeah. of the Rings. Yeah, I, the Flies. And that's the first thing I thought, Lord of the Flies. It could be, but see, I, I, I've seen, I, I see Lord of the Flies at the HBCUs because they just out there partying. At the HBCUs, a lot of these young people coming from Africana ways of knowing, from governance structures. They got home training. See, but so far, they're going to go. However, there's not the Dr. Watkins or Dr. Beatty or Dr. Carr. And let me pause here and say, to her credit, since assuming the deanship and the beginning of the formal school year, I have heard many times, or ran into Dean Rashad today. I don't know how she's doing it, Karen. Mm -hmm. I don't know how she's doing, Professor Hunter. I don't know when the rehearsal schedule for her latest Broadway work is going to happen, kick in and maybe change the change the direction. But Felicia Rashad been on that campus many days. I've seen it too. I've seen it too. Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. I and love people, it. people been posting it. You know, I ran into okay. you know young people post and she be in there. Yeah, and you know, out out holding court the way you you would hold court. Holding then, court in front so. of the fine arts building. It's really, I mean, again, but I wouldn't expect anything less because she was in school when they took over the building in '68. In fact, she's got classmates who are on the faculty over there. In fact, maybe day two of the Blackburn takeover, which I'll get to again in terms of demand. So you asked me a very specific question. Um, uh, Akili Anderson, Baba Akili, one of our great, uh, great. Uh, artists he and james phillips in fact uh maybe the last two left uh on the faculty at howard university in the college of fine arts the uh the newly reestablished because it was a college for many years in fact the newly reestablished because in the student protests of 1989 and 90 uh no not even 1989 and 90 oh what am i saying this is the late 90s because chad bozeman graduated the year i came to howard in 2000 the the fine arts students and others rushed the stage and did a camp and did a takeover the administration building because this was during the period when they merged the College of Fine Arts with the College of Arts and Sciences. And there's a famous picture in the Hilltop, the Howard student newspaper of Chad Bozeman with his finger in the face of the then president, Pat Swigert, the same guy who me and him and the rest of these faculty and administrators trying to get these students away from the building while they staged their thousands of people protest. Ananda Lewis was out there that day. I never forget from BET because her daddy, she said, I'm out here because I'm a Howard person and my daddy's on, on active duty in Iraq right now. This guy got to go. But I'm saying it was that same president under his presidency with the decision was made to merge fine arts and Chad Bozeman as a student. Uh, one of his best friends, uh, uh, what's my man's name? The cinematographer. He's one of Holly's students. Um, Brad, Bradford Young. Brad Young, the cinematographer who did, you know, Selma, Ava DuVernay. He and Ava DuVernay done a lot of work together. Um, Brad was in that takeover and they tell that story all the time. But I'm saying the newly reestablished 
Chadwick Boseman School of Fine Arts. Uh, she sits, Dean Rashad sits on that bench. I've seen her sitting on that. I haven't seen her, but the students have seen her. And in fact, when I come over, when I go over to Sankofa periodically, you know, all the Sankofa crew is like, well, Dean Rashad was over here. I said, she be coming over here? They're low key. She sends the lunch orders over here. She support. I mean, so it's clear that just like the rest of us, the commitment to work in a black space comes with responsibility other than flexing and saying, I'm in a black school. No, where are you? I don't say I never see you. I see Dean Rashado. So I got to give her that shout out. So uh, Akili, though, that's what I was going to say. Akili Anderson, who was in school with them, uh, James Phillips, these two are artists who are in the College of Fine Arts. Uh, they are the last two, I think, on the faculty in fine arts who were members of the African coalition of uh, uh, bad relevant art artists. Some of you all who are into art know Afri Cobra. In fact, there is uh, there's there's several uh, there's several new books on Afri Cobra. This is one of them. Abdullah Kalamat has one. There are a number, and then of course there's the old stuff that you'll never find anywhere because that stuff is out of print. But you can get this one. This is Wildworth Jarrell's book Afri Cobra. Y'all want to know about Afri Cobra? Experimental art toward a school of thought. These are the black people in the black arts movement in the late 60s, early 70s, who really redefined art for black people in many ways by tapping into Africana and doing improvisation. So if you're thinking in our conceptual categories, go to cultural meaning making, which is what they did during their time, but also movement and memory. How did or do Africans remember that experience? Because, of course, this Malcolm X uh, piece, which is uh, Black Prince, 1971, by Wallsworth Jarrell. Wadsworth Jarrell, that's 1971. Malcolm was assassinated in 65, of course. So movement and memory. How do we remember these experiences? Anyway, Baba Akili and Baba James are the last two from Africa Cobra on the faculty right now. Akili took his students, his art students, he's teaching them art, took them from fine arts, which is like here, to Blackburn, which is right here, just walked out of this building, went into that build, went in front of that building, and had his art students sit there and sketch. To protest on oh, when snow was there are many ways to show solidarity and show support you know we're not telling y'all what to do but we want you all to know we're here and so that's why i went over there uh the uh went over there friday night now what they want is to be secure to be safe to be out of harm's way in terms of being comfortable in the accommodations they're paying for uh, Howard has the administration has responded and said, well, we, we are housing well, our occupancy rates up to 94 percent. We have. Yeah. But the students then come back very quickly with. Yeah, that's true. That may be true. But it's also true that there's been a lot of sketchy uh, deployment of, 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 you know, procured housing. Like there's some housing out by, in fact, on near the campus of the University of Maryland that makes transportation difficult. I mean, all kind of issues. That, that that dovetail into this. I mean, of course, there was a cyber attack and, and Wi-Fi hasn't been restored completely. And so what you're seeing is this this back and forth between students. And of course, interestingly enough, again, science and technology, because much of specific student uh, experiences can be documented now visually. And you ain't got to worry about CNN or getting the attention of the New York Times or worrying about the Washington Post. You can literally upload it. What you see is it's it's difficult to sustain a narrative where everybody has access to everybody. Mm -hmm. So it it, it it keeps us honest in a way. Well, that's not true. Well, if that's not true, what's this? Uh, 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 silence. And so, OK, so what you see is these 18, 19 year olds. Again, they've been at home for two years and they got mom and daddy in them. So I'm, you know, some can write the check, some scrimping to pay, and everybody in between. There are students who are emancipated minors, were emancipated minors. I have several students. In fact, one of the brightest students I have, I'm not going to get, you know, obviously I'm not going to share her name, but this young lady has been her own, her own, so she's like, she's just like 15. She is at Howard University by virtue of her genius and her work ethic. And she's got to negotiate the terms of whether she can come back to Howard semester to semester. What COVID did was relieve her of a financial burden that now that she's back on campus, she's got to negotiate. I'm going to get the money for room and board. I didn't have that, I didn't have that bill before. And this child, for her to say, black mold, I have, here it is, Dr. Carr. Oh, oh, yeah, nah. See, this is not, you can't, you, th you this, no. No. And so I'm saying I have to say that these are basic demands. And, and in fact, 
I want to show you all something, uh, a book. And then we, and then I want to keep going. We're going to go. We're going to have a lot of dialogue on this. I know we don't have all day, but this is so important because what I really want to do is put it in the context of yeah. HBCUs generally. Yeah. Uh, this is an important book called Student Unrest on Historically Black Campuses. Charles U. Smith, who was a dean at Florida A&M. This book came out in 1994, but it was written in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, that, Charles, in fact, let me just tell you what. Let me just read what Charles Smith says. Here's his brother Smith here on the back, Charles U. Smith, fam, you. He says, when Martin Luther King, when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4th, 1968, I was returning to Tallahassee from an out-of-town speaking engagement. Because I felt that the students at Florida A&M, or what he says, Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, fam, you, with a long history of civil rights activism, would because I felt that they would protest the killing of Dr. King, I drove straight to the campus before going to my home. Again, special relationship at HBCUs. Anyway, long story short, Smith goes, he sees what's going on. He says it was an early, it was an early evening, darkness had fallen, the FAMU campus was alive with crowds of students milling, shouting epithets and encouragement to one another as they sought to vent their frustration and anger. A fire had been started at a white old mobile home sales lot adjacent to the campus, but no university buildings or facilities were being damaged. Same as case with Blackburn. I went over there. I saw for myself. I know the students that said they had that. They're sanitizing. When I tell you these young people look like they done, they didn't open a mass unit. Oh, how many tables of stuff y'all got? I'm just looking. It ain't no, look, most. I'm, I, I virtually none of. I don't know that any of them knew I was there last night. Again, I'm just, you know, I'm like what? They sanitizing the space they have on the first floor of the student center. They the bathrooms. They clean. They doing all that maintenance by themselves. Now, initially. The idea was from administration representatives that somehow, you know, they were violating student contact. There was a safety hazard, they had to shut the university. And their response was, no, we are, you know, and it, no, we're not. We're not doing any of that. And, and so when I'm reading Smith, rereading Smith, it makes me smile because Smith is like, they weren't tearing up their campus. A fire had been started at a white owned mobile home sales lot adjacent to the campus, but no university buildings or facilities were being damaged. Some students in large clusters were intercepting all vehicles passing on campus streets and screening the occupants to ensure that no white persons were cruising through the campus. Now, you know, I'm watching last night how different student groups are interacting with each other. The student newspaper, The Hilltop, which has been covering a great deal of this, the student government, which has been facilitating a lot of this and came out in solidarity. I'm watching at the door, just standing back watching. As the students who are inside are saying to the student newspaper, hey, we all together, we all students, but we can't let y'all in the building because these students are risking it all and we're all in solidarity, but we'll send people out to talk to you. And, and the student newspaper people saying, we understand. I'm like, this is a very interesting moment for me as someone who participated in that work and someone who not only is an undergrad, but as a law student and then a graduate student at several institutions, including at the time, the biggest white university in the country where black people had no choice but to be in solidarity, who took steps way beyond what these young people are doing. And so I'm watching that and I'm thinking about Smith. And so what happens is Smith gets some money from the Russell Sage Foundation to write about student unrest at HBCU campuses. They give him a grant. They give him several grants. Those grants go from the late 80s into the early 90s. He gets five other researchers at five different campuses to write, write narratives of student protest at these HBCUs that they are at. Florida a and Howard, Shaw, I'm going to come back to Shaw in about 60 seconds, Tuskegee, South Carolina State, 1966 to 68, the 60s there. But it's going on for years. He turns in a report to Russell Sage. And it says, what, upon the recommendation of the resident sociologist at the time at Russell Sage. So here you go. You've turned in what you know to be true, scholars at HBCUs, and this white foundation going to turn your work over to another sociologist. And I'm not going to say whether he was white or black because I don't know, but I can guess. Who felt that the manuscripts needed greater mass appeal. Did they write this for a governance structure as it is? Or did they write this to explain to you their humanity, the social structure? Here's the problem. The Russell Sage Foundation employed a journalist to rewrite these case studies in a more new in a more news magazine style for greater lay consumption. Lay consumption. What the hell does that mean? His efforts pleased neither the RSF nor me. And for years, the manuscripts languished in the files of the RSF. Finally, at my request, the RSF gave me full and exclusive rights to the case studies to be published and or utilized as I saw fit. So he finally published this himself. Beckham House Publishers in Silver Spring, Maryland. 
1994. This is an extremely valuable book to read, but you know, I think Charles Smith is an ancestor now. This may be one we had to get Paul Coates maybe to, to, to get the rights to and reproduce because it's extremely bad. I see y'all see the, the table of contents. You see the table of contents there. The one I'm going to draw quick attention to to answer finally answer your question in terms of broad is chapter three. Wilmoth A. Carter, student unrest at Shaw University. Wilmoth Carter, Dr. Carter says this, page 79. Professor Carter says this. She says, Wait, I should show you her picture. This is what I love about them old school HBCU professors. That's her. That's Wilmoth Carter. Y'all remember when we talked about Wilmington and we were talking about Helen Edmonds, Dr. Edmonds at Ohio State and the years in North Carolina Central. This is her colleague who was at Shaw, Wilmoth Carter. When Wilmoth Carter wrote this, she was near retirement. This is a book she wrote called The New Negro of the South, A Portrait of Movements and Leadership by Wilmoth A. Carter, Director, Division of Social Sciences, Shaw University, Exposition Press. Y'all see the uh, the date on this? This is the first edition, 1967. This is a scholar who had been at Shaw for years when she wrote the chapter that's in this book right here. She'd been an ancestor so long, it's not even funny. HBCUs, it's been my experience, are either in a benign sense, completely neglectful, or in a deliberate sense, contemptuous of institutional memory. In other words, many of the mistakes that are repeated are based on the fact that they didn't even read or study or listen to the vast archive of conversations that we have had about the very same subject. And some people say, why are we facing this again? What did you do last time? Well, I mean, I, yeah. Wilmoth Carter says, until the sixth decade of the 20th century, the traditional Negro American college, while not devoid of student unrest, tended to have its campus dissidents directed more toward problems arising from internal management than from outside forces. Strikes and revolts of various kinds have always existed, but until recent years, they tended to be directed not so much at social issues as at disciplines, traditions, and such. And that is major part of what's going on now. There are internal issues. If you get this book, Ray Walter's book, The, Black, the New Negro on Campus, Black College, you see what it says, Black College, rebellions of the 1920s, the 1920s. Do you understand? Look at this, look at this table of contents. Du Bois in the rebellion at Fisk, James Stanley Durkee in the rising tide of color at Howard, Major Moton defeats the Klan, the case of the Tuskegee Veterans Hospital, travails of Nathan B. Young, rites of passage, Hampton Institute becomes a college. Chapter seven, Lincoln, Pennsylvania, Wilberforce and points north. This is, this is the 20s y'all. But what Wilmoth Carter is saying is they're often internal issues, they are not, they are not exclusive to white school to black schools. You have white schools with very similar issues, but unlike white schools, HBCUs operate in the black governance structure. So the expectations are different. We say they're not different. They're all college students. Okay, this is where you should probably sew your lips shut, because if, in fact, somebody, in fact, come on back, because I was going to raise this. A student was telling me this. Uh, we were in class and a student said, you know, we experience HBCUs like the black family. Here go to uncle at Thanksgiving. Everybody know need to get gathered and ain't nobody saying nothing. <laughs> so if you want to understand Blackburn takeover, just look in the family, look in the governance category and you will, you will have a point of entry for everything else we're going to talk about today. And this is, so can we break that, you know, um, we had a parent call up as well, another parent who said, you know, when her daughter experienced these issues, uh, she went and gathered up other parents and they collectively went to the administration and her daughter ended up getting a refund and all the other children of the parents that uh, went in Moss to uh, confront Howard, uh, the administration about the issues they were having, they, they, they listened. And I said, you know, a lot of times we complain in the void or to one another, but we don't gather our forces to go directly. And parents have more, as much power, uh, if not more than the, than the students, you know, uh, in many ways. Yes. And, you know, it's their responsibility too. I mean, you're sending your child there. I, I think that governance structure is killing us on so many levels. The, the, the inability, or, you know, when you brought up the uncle and the family, you know, we're, we're seeing it play out so frequently 
so free. We have to be able to hold one another accountable to get better. And we cannot give people a free pass. I think they should be held doubly accountable. The Bible says, woe to teachers and scribes, you know, teachers and uh, preachers, for you'll be held doubly accountable because you're responsible doubly. So I feel like we should be harder on folk who do harm to us, who look like us. Yes. Than than other people. I expect white folks to do what white folk do. We yeah. should never accept poor treatment uh, at the hands of black people. I'm sorry. No, I, I agree. I agree. I agree. In fact, it's interesting you say that. I was, um, you know, there was a, a, a there's a sister, very brilliant sister at uh, at Princeton and the African American States Department there, uh, Kiyagi Yamada Taylor. Um, a very powerful mind at work there and very deeply engaged in social movement beyond the university, which, again, is, is something that we're going to talk about in the context of what's going on right now at Howard. And by extension, because it's also important to understand that this this hashtag Blackburn takeover is certainly Howard directed at the moment. But it's really emerging as best as I can tell out of a uh, an HBCU wide group of students who have been in dialogue for quite some time. And I know this just from, you know, kind of seeing them a little bit on social media. Again, you know, you 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 engage young people, you listen to young people, you, you help young people think, you pride them to think it's the role of the faculty to do that, but it is not the role to direct them. Um, as a brother who was once the president of the University of the District of Columbia, one of the oldest HBCUs in the country. In fact, if you go to Miners Teachers College, it was it, its roots go back to 1851. It's certainly the oldest HBCU in D.C. and the only public HBCU in D.C. It's the flagship HBCU of the District of Columbia. At one time, president of UDC said, you know, there's nothing more contemptuous than a faculty member who will fight his or her battles through students. So you shouldn't know you shouldn't do that. But in listening uh, to uh, Kianga Yamada, to listening to Professor Taylor, she put on Twitter the other day that Howard's administration hides behind the history of the university to shroud its neoliberal corporatist agenda. It's neoliberal corporatist agenda. Another example of the political trap of imagined racial solidarity that shrouds real class conflict and the agenda of the suits in charge. Um, that wait, 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 break that down a little bit. Um, so, so yesterday, and, and you've done this many times as we mentioned in class with Carr, talked about the origins, the original, you know, uh, purpose for HBCUs. And yeah. I, I just want to reiterate that because how a thing starts, what a thing is rooted in, you know, the beginnings of a thing, it usually, you know, unless you completely pull those roots up and plant something new, you're going to see vestiges of the, of that origin forever unless we eradicate That's it. Right. I think, That's you right. know, That's um, right. just like Facebook found it to troll women on campuses and rate them Right. It's a troll uh, app. That's right. still the troll app. That's exactly so, right. So uh, what was the purpose of the founding of HBCUs in America well, and who founded them? Mostly? Well, that's that's the challenge. And, th and that's where I was going with uh, Professor Taylor's quote. Uh, a great deal of what she said in that quote that, you know, is not unique to Howard in terms of the neoliberal university. That's why the model is unsustainable. Uh, the corporatist university, the model is unsustainable, at least in terms, if your objective is, 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 is education for a great number of people. When she goes on to say, you know, this is another example of the political trap of imagined racial solidarity that shrouds real class conflict in the agenda of the suits in charge. This is where I say we need to have a continuing conversation about that in the context of the governance structure, because I would think about a statement like that from somebody who's at Princeton. Not as airy, airing dirty laundry. I think that that's not very useful. I would think of it, first of all, as a governance conversation, because just because she's at a HPCU doesn't mean that she's not part of the governance structure. We have governance conversation. That's not the issue. But I think that's an example of what I might refer to borrowing from Derek Bell, uh, one of the pillars of so-called critical race theory. I would kind of change his notion of colorblind constitutionalism and say that that's a that's a that's a remark that I would call perhaps colorblind critique. In other words, it may be true, but when you wire it through the hopes, the expectations, the beliefs of HBCUs, you've got to separate that out from the agenda. For example, it's very interesting. There's a brand new book that just came out by this brother here, uh, Devarian Baldwin. It's called In the Shadow of the Ivory Tower. 
how universities are plundering our cities. We talk talking about affordability and not and, and living not being affordable. These universities are huge landlords. And why you want the biggest land is, is NYU mm -hmm. the biggest landlord? I mean, so you know, housing isn't an issue for NYU, but if you're a poor student and not on financial aid, you're not going to New York University. If you're not on scholarship or if you are, you're going into high debt. There's a great documentary from about seven, eight years ago called Ivory Tower. Uh, before COVID, every Friday, beginning in February, continuing through the end of the semester in the Department of Afro-American Studies, we set up and screen a movie and we have our conversations. This is in the tradition of the great scholar uh, Acklin Lynch, who's still alive, still here in the District of Columbia. He used to have something called Conversations in Blackness in Founders Library. So we, we, we revived that. This is the thing, y'all. People saying they create stuff. You look at them real suspicious when it comes to black people because nine times, 9.99% hmm. of the time, somebody did it before. And when you cut yourself off from the momentum of memory, you are placing yourself, you, you in danger of being a virtue hoarder. <laughs> Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So at any rate, so, but one of the films we screened, because I saw it in the theaters and I could not wait till the DVD came out. When the DVD came, I had it on back order when it came. I said, okay, this next week, we're, we're going to watch this documentary. It's called Ivory Tower. And it's when the students at Cooper's Union, and Prof, you know what Cooper's Union is, right? Mm -hmm. down, 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 They took over the president's office at Cooper's Union. And it was about affordability because they were going up on, because, you know, Cooper's Union was founded with the idea that it was accessible. So affordability was something very big for Cooper's Union. This elite institution that is accessible, but now they're going to have a, a tuition raise, and they're going. So these students took over the president's, and they did a documentary. And what and what what Ivory Tower does is it focuses on four different institutions, and it shows the administrators saying, "Hey, we got to do you know." In fact, one of the opening scenes, you have a parents meeting. One of the presidents of a small liberal arts college, white dude, this white audience of parents. And the guy says, one of the parents says, Miss President, I understand the, the money, the debt, you got to, you know, I seem you got to worry about. He said, but can I just ask a question? Because this is a liberal arts education, right? He says, will my daughter be able to get a job with that degree? <laughs> and so, and so, what I'm, I'm saying this all in the context of where HBCUs come from, because in one of the four schools, because Cooper's Union was the one that kind of was the best. And I encourage people to watch these documentaries. It's fascinating because what you see is the rising amount of debt students go into, which makes the idea of majoring in something that will give you a job the baseline. I tell students all the time, as I was a theater major and I went to law school, because what I found out was you could go to law school if you can read and write. And then Sonia Sotomayor told the first year she was on the bench, she came to Howard Law School and I heard this out her mouth in my ear sitting right in front of her. It was the first law school she came to after she was put on the bench. She said, I want to come to Howard, talk to the students. Now, mind you, the first question when it came to question and answer, the students asked her is, I know since you're talking about we got to diversify the court and all this kind of thing, when are you going to hire some black clerks? <laughs> So, so I'm saying, because Ruth Bader Ginsburg ain't never hired no black clerks. Shout out to Katie Couric. I know you bumping for your girl. We see you. Anyway, the point is no black clerks, no brown clerks. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, the point is this. Sonny Sonny, one of them asked her, you know, what does it take to be a clerk? And she said, you got to read and write beautifully. And you got to know the law. That sounds like a broad thing. But you do that well. And you could be a clerk. Now I'm looking at her record of hiring clerks. And I'm like, but anyway, the point is this. When you think about in this documentary, you know, the liberal arts, I was a theater major and I went to law school because what I found, I majored in what I loved. In another life, I'd have been a musician or actor. In fact, I still do, you know, how many shows a week, right, as a teacher. But the point is that I got to law school and because of my love of language, love of reading and writing, that's what the law is, is reading and writing. Well, now it's just basically clan politics, but that's a whole nother conversation. You got it. Getting in the room requires a basic level of reading and writing. So, you know, but when that doc, what that documentary shows is that many of these universities and Arizona state was one that was highlighted too. They showed how many millions are put into these schools and using areas as on state as a model, like rock climbing walls and 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 boutique foods in the cafe and all these student experiences. In other words, they uh, there's a book called Academically Adrift that talks about this. Uh, Joseph Recipa and I forget the uh, Arun Richard Arun is this is the co-author talks about how for many now undergraduates 
It is the undergraduate experience that becomes the reason to come to school, the network of the prestige of the school. And when you're there, you want the amenities. You want the, you know, the various food options and the, you want the, 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 the suite of toys. I mean, Arizona State apparently has built this basically amusement park at Arizona State. And so when you're going for campus tours, you're matching amenities. Well, HBCU is not going to have those amenities. They're not, they're simply not going to have them. And as these schools get richer and rich, richer and richer, y'all heard me many times mention Scott Galloway, who, who you know, writes about, it. he's got this book uh, post Corona where he's talking about that he's in NYU. He said they're basically hedge funds. These elite schools are now hedge funds with classes for the children of the investors with a few freakishly smart kids they let in to cover the fact that they're basically hedge funds. Johns Hopkins. I mean, Howard got a lot of money this last year, but it ain't nothing compared to Hopkins. And in fact, they said, well, Howard gets a federal appropriation. Do you know how much money gets funneled to these big public HPCUs from the NIH? Who gets gets funneled to these these, these those, those smaller dollars and very small dollars from the NEH? But you know how much money that gets sent to white schools, but even to black faculty at white schools. And so what you see is there that you will never lay the level that playing field, but it's all so increasingly unsustainable that there is a reckoning coming. And as is the case with natural disasters, and COVID is one. Man-made, of course, by pushing into nature and nature put you back, but natural un nonetheless, COVID don't know race. What you see is it accelerates trends. This is the way higher education was going anyway, which is, again, why I said we're going to jailbreak the, the, the black university and you and I. And then, you know, with Carl and Reyes and the team that's growing and growing and every person that joins Nubia every day and comes into narrative every day. We are now creating something that the HBCUs were never designed to do which is what? Jailbreak education. And so the HBCUs fit in two categories. And I'm going to give you all a couple of references I've given you before, but I'm going to do them again because, again, this is in the context. My old professor, my very good friend, an elder now, the great Bobby L. Lovett out of Arkansas, America's Historically Black Colleges and Universities of Narrative History, 1837 to 2009. Bobby L. Lovett. Get that book. Also, uh, it's a nice little compendium here. Eric Brooks and Glenn Starks did a book called Historically Black Colleges and Universities, an encyclopedia. It's a nice, nice resource to have. And then what you do is surround it. It's been increasingly more works on HBCUs, but a book I would recommend, which is you can never. Uh, in fact, I teach this book every fall in my Education in Black America class. And I told I got a chance to tell this brother this. I don't know him except I've met him a couple of times. And when my students, my undergraduate students came down to see him give a talk in D.C. and came with their copies of this book. Um, let me see if I can move some books around because I got my class stack over here and I kind of keep them in the same place. It makes it easier. Now I got to go looking for my stuff. Uh, James Anderson, The Education of Blacks in the South. That's Snow Hill, Alabama. A picture here. Snow Hill was an institute in Alabama that was founded to do voc ed. In fact, the, the, the brother who started, he did a book called, what is it, Black Belt in the South? 25 Years in the Black Belt. Edwards was his name. Uh, I, had, I had the book somewhere over here, my rare book side. But it then moved into the fine arts. Consuela Lee was on faculty for many years there in teaching, in teaching music. Uh, Consuela Lee, of course, is Bill Lee's sister. Uh, Bill Lee, of course, is the father of Spike Lee. That's who Delroy Lindo is playing in Crooklyn. Well, his sister was on the faculty at Snow Hill. I mean, the arts. But I'm saying I'd say this in terms of background. There are two strains of HBCUs, often overlapping, but the two strains. They're the schools that Black people started and they're the schools that white people started. And sometimes the school that Black people started end up being the schools that white people begin to try to seize control of. And what James Anderson does a brilliant job of in the first chapter of this book, The Education of Blacks in the South, Ex-Slaves and the Rise of, of Universal Education in the South, 1860 to 1880, what he shows is two things. Number one, African people were educating our children before the end of enslavement. We figured out ways to do it. Number two, coming out of enslavement, a place like Louisiana, a place like South Carolina is a beautiful picture in here. For example, I just show you all because I just love this picture. In fact, I got a one that they colored in. And I show my students, and I love when we have these conversations with students and us have this kind of, we talked about the Rosenwald schools. I have students whose grandparents went to Rosenwald schools. And some of you all have the people in this family. This is Zion School in Charleston, South Carolina. Look at all them black people. Look at all, this is December 1866, you see. It was established in 1865. 
The wow. Civil War ended in a, they, they fully clothed. And, and you see this brother at the front and you see all these sisters who are on faculty. Where did these Negroes come from? Where? Well, you had Civil War veterans like Carl G. Woodson's uncles. When you joined the army, they taught you how to read and write. Many of those men left the military, became school teachers. Many of the women who had snuck and learned, or even the, the small group of free blacks turned around and said, we're going to teach our children. One of the conflicts Jim Anderson gets into in chapter one of the education of blacks in the South is that when white missionaries came, black people were like, okay, cool. You got some money? Yeah, you got some money. Good. Thank you. Bye. Wait, what? Yeah, no, we'll take your money. We'll take your material resources, but we don't want you teaching our children. See, <laughs> so what Jim Anderson shows is, now, now, why wouldn't black people who came out of slavery want these good white people to teach their children? Well, it's cold outside. I had to invent a word called ashy. Uh, <laughs> uh, you've helped quite enough. <laughs> you understand? I still have this scar on my back from your friend. I know you're from Boston, but your but your sister from Alabama. You said, no, just go back. In Louisiana, they was like, and the Freedmen's Bureau people, this cat named Alfred, who was the Freedmen's Bureau secretary, he's going around saying these Negroes don't organize themselves. Where are they getting the money? They they don't the, the parents say they don't want the white teachers. Now, of course, you got white teachers who are very well meaning. And we, we talk about that now. In fact, we've talked about this before, but let me, let me get to the HBCUs. You have some black formations. The African Methodists, the African Methodist Episcopals, the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, Livingstone in North Carolina, AME Church, Allen in South Carolina. We did the whole discussion of Dave Chappelle before. Uh, parenthetically, it looks like there's, there's still in a continuing attempt to, you know, figure out how to to cancel Dave Chappelle. And we, we maybe we do that whole now. Maybe we do this during office hours. We still haven't really talked about Chappelle. I mean, for whatever reasons, not Chappelle as Chappelle, but it's Chappelle as a point of entry for another kind of conversation. It's fascinating. It's something on the front page of New York Times today, in fact, about um, you know, it's in class. There's no reason why we can't uh take a detour because I know you're gonna come back. Yeah, I ain't, yeah, I, ain't, I, ain't, I just thought it was interesting. Was it today's paper on Chappelle? Oh, yeah, Ted Sarandos, a co chief. In fact, this is on B1. I haven't looked at the paper yet. I haven't spent all night rethinking about black universities. We ain't even got to the point. Yes, on page B1. Uh oh wow. Uh all right, as you're looking for it, um it is. Netflix is <laughs> the the head of Netflix is sticking behind him and the um the walkout leader got fired, the person that uh organized the walkout of transgendered and allied folk at uh Netflix they got fired um I don't think Chappelle can, is gonna get canceled or can get canceled I don't know you nothing surprises me it may surprise you I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised I don't know what's gonna happen Netflix is not pulling it they they're doubling down right and uh, you know this is where capitalism comes in you know they did a dollar cost analysis and they're like uh yeah and this freedom of speech and uh he's a comedian and uh you know, the protests that are happening internally, which is interesting. Maybe there's a juxtaposition, you know, but different. You know, they, they had internal protests at Netflix. Folk walked out, threatened to walk out. They, they you know, wanted Netflix to, to you know, rid the platform of, of Chappelle's uh, latest, The Closer. Netflix was like, no. And the person that organized the walkout got fired. So interesting. Where, where's the cancellation? Well... Not yet, because as you say, it's a well, so wait, wait, okay, kick it, kick it down. Because uh, as this goes on, I I see it losing steam, not gaining. I, I I wouldn't like. I think I, Howard's gaining steam. Well, like, I, I think that snowball is getting bigger. It's a that different. That getting smaller. It's a different cost, like you said, in a neoliberal model, profit is the god. This is why the white interests, in fact, chapter two of the education in blacks in the south is called the hampton model of normal school education samuel chapman armstrong a purebred racist who purebred. a purebred, purebred you know i mean there are racists who kind of fall into it because of circumstances there are racists who are racist and don't know it you know liberal friends who think they're helping black people by saying you don't want to go to that school you you want to go to a good school like one of my high school counselors was like you don't want to go to tennessee state you you, you, we, you could get into other schools, you know, a, a better school. Um, um, but I had black counselors who knew better. Uh, 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 liberal racists like those who, when I finished my PhD, was like, 
uh, you don't want to go to a Howard or something. You, you know, you could you could go to any school and you could go work in the Ivy League. You know, those are liberal racists. And then you have purebred racists like Samuel Chapman Armstrong, who believed black people were an inferior race, who cut his eye teeth on messing with non-whites in the Hawaiian islands where he went after uh, the indigenous people. In fact, Hampton was set up to kill the Indian initially. In other words, cut their hair, change your clothes, don't ever learn the language of your ancestors and become good semi-humans. And then so that same model Armstrong wanted to put on to black people, you know, bust your ass, early to bed, early to rise, learn enough skills to make sure you don't cut your hands off in the machine. And remember what Jesus said. I mean, this this is basically that head and heart moral education thing. And of course, their ace pupil was Booker Taliaferro Washington from Hill Fort, Virginia, who set up a similar model at Tuskegee, except except Washington. And this is what Paulo Freire and others would call the surplus value of education. Anytime you begin educating and collect a, a critical mass of oppressed people, they are going to take what you have, regardless of your best attempts to guide them and come up with their own ideas. There's a surplus value of education. You can't control them. So I'm saying not to say that that thrust in HBCUs, which and not just HBCUs, the normal schools, the common schools, there are levels of schools. So you go from birth to training. And then you had training schools for teachers. This is the normal school tradition. A lot of HBCUs had normal school components. They're, they're, they're basically teacher education schools to go out and get these black teachers who will then turn around and train what Jim Anderson refers to correctly as the workforce. Because see, after slavery is over, they don't want black people to stop being slaves. They just can't be slaves no more in the, in the direct sense. It's going to be indirect now which is actually economically more profitable because you can shift the cost of feeding, of clothing, you know, and you can create, a, 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 sustain a field of violence by terrorizing them, debt peonage, sharecropping, and this kind of thing. Well, meanwhile, while this is going on, and there are no black people in the planning of these things, they have meetings in Cape and Springs, West Virginia, Lake Mohawk, New York. Uh, in fact, I learned that first from uh, my Jegna's um, Asa Hilliard, Jacob Carruthers, who wrote about this extensively. In fact, get a book called Too Much Schooling, too Little Education, uh, my very good friend, um, Walimu Shuja, uh, published Africa World Press. Y'all get that get that book. In fact, that was a book. I was It warmed my heart. Last night, as I'm looking around, I saw a copy of that book floating around in front of, uh, in, in, among the students who were all stretched out. I said, you know what? This, why, this is why I work at a black school. Homecoming is cool. You know, I was in a marching band. I know what it is. But this is why I came. A book that I wouldn't see at Harvard is here at Howard and it's being read by somebody who's taking the next lap and what that book is about. But at any rate, there, this, this attempt, William Watkins wrote a very good book on this too called The White Architects of Black Education. This attempt to direct the education of black people coming out of enslavement by white philanthropists, white government uh, officials, and in an alliance between, as Jim Anderson talks about this now, morphing Southern plantocracy, these former plantation owners, some of who returned to the South, a new rising business, business class in the South in league with white business interests in the North doing a dollar and cents calculation and back mapping that into the curriculum of the common schools, common schools for elementary school students, the normal schools for older students, including those who are going to turn to teachers and the black colleges and universities. In other words, we're creating, we want a labor force curriculum. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to succeed because black people got their own ideas. But the other thrust, which is why Anderson said the history of education of black people in the United States has always been a history of education for second, third class citizenship and a history of education for developing the fullest human potential, their highest potential, to use another incredible scholar whose work is so important, the great Vanessa Siddle Walker at Emory University. In fact, we're in week two of my Education of Black uh, America class of reading her remarkable book, The Lost Education of Horace Tate. If I could if I could put my hands on that, show it to you all. Uh, but um, she did a book called Their Highest Potential about the segregated schools in North Carolina. Another book called Hello Professor, which is uh, Ulysses K, the history of a black educator in North Carolina, a principal who made transition before he could tell his own story. So Vanessa Walker took his memoir, finished it, filled it out, and then put her, them as co-authors. Very important work, Professor Walker. Uh, but at any rate, there's a thrust then among these black people to have their own ideas. So whether it be the AME, AME Zion, whether it be the, the Baptist, um, Seventh Day Adventist, Oakwood, well, you have black people who come up with these HBCUs and there's a real conflict. 
It's not just the vocational education versus liberal arts conflict that we often read about, Du Bois versus Booker T. Washington, however you want to frame it. And the liberal arts tradition was generally represented by Atlanta University, um, Morehouse, Spelman, Fisk, Howard. That's what they kind of called it. The voc ed was like Hampton and those allied with it. And then by the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, you see the moral land grant colleges, the HBCUs, the moral land grant was uh, was uh, federal expenditures for each state to create a flagship state university. That's where you get at Ohio State. That's where you get the University of Michigan. That's where you get these A&M schools, Texas A&M, so forth. And then because of Jim Crow in the South, you create black versions, North Carolina A&T, Florida A&M, Tennessee A&I, so forth. Some of them not even created until the first quarter of the 20th century. So now you've got state schools, but the objectives, again, you've got liberal arts, developing the mind potential with extremely white facing curricula. It's going to be important by the time we get to the 60s. And then you've got the, the opening up in terms of class structure because at HBCUs, I mean, at all schools, but at HBCUs, there's always a high concentration of what we call first generation college students. I was a first generation college student. That is not an accomplishment as far as I'm concerned. That is an indictment of the field of violence called the United States of America that would deprive all of our ancestors of education. So, and let me say that that deprivation is recent. It's only the last several hundred years. In fact, there's a brand new book that just came out. I'm really enjoying it. Um, I don't know if you've run across Howard French in your travel. Do you know Howard French? He used to write for the New York Times. Yeah. I, I, uh, I want to say I do, but I'm. Yeah, you probably you probably do. I'm. Sure, I, I figured you probably did, and I'm not going to be able to find it because I got a lot of stuff stacked up. You know, we in the annotation, we'll we'll pull it up. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But uh, but I want it because it has a lot to do. In fact, while I was looking for that, there's Vanessa Walker's book, The Lost Education of Horace Tate. I just like Vanessa Walker because, in addition to being a scholar, I showed my students a video of her, Emory Jimmy Carter. Since she's actually talking. She's also just got home training. She's just a just a beautiful human being in terms of the way she approaches black life. Very much a governance structure mm. scholar. So, um, which is very important because a lot of people are not governance structure scholar. They writing stuff to show white people they smart, and it's like uh, that's just embarrassing. You shouldn't even. Uh, let me see. I'm very much surprised that I did something with that book. Anyway, the book Howard French wrote is called Born in Blackness. Um, as he says at the beginning of the book, it's not really a lot of original research, but what he does is narrate how, and this is his basic thesis, I'm gonna keep it very short because it relates to HBCUs in my mind in this way, in a large field of black education. He says, people, we all learned the history of modern history like this, the age of exploration of Europe and they came out looking for blah, blah, blah. He says, no, no, no. What modern history really is it's going to bother me until I find it. And there it is. <laughs> <laughs> it was behind me. Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans, and the Making of the Modern World, 1471 to the Second World War. It's very interesting. Just book just came out. What French says is the history of the modern world is, is, is this. Western Eurasia was trapped. The Muslims to the east. You know, they don't really have no. And say, while a and then and then beyond that, the Asian world, China you know, Korea it says what Europe did, what, what we know now as Europe, Western Eurasia, particularly those who were abutting the ocean. So the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, eventually England right there, the islands right there. He said, what they did was France, what they did was they used Africa to get into world history. The Muslim world was already in world history. The Asian world was already in world history. The unsuspecting almost 100 million human beings in what we now call the Western Hemisphere was already in world history. The people who weren't in the game for real is Europe. So what French says is they went to Africa and he traces it and all this stuff, as he said, it's not original, but I love the way he's narrating it. I mean, he's got a real flair for language. And he's, he's written two books on China and, and one, on, one on China proper, another on China and Africa. He calls, in fact, he's got a book called Africa, China's Second Continent. It's brilliant. But anyway, what French says is that these, these Europeans, because remember Columbus and them, they did not go into the Western Hemisphere first. They cut their eye teeth looking for gold in Africa. 
In fact, it was African resources that were substantially responsible for filling the coffers of the Europeans that financed the exploration. He goes through the history of Columbus. They're, they're at a place called like Elmina. Elmina, of course, is in Guy. You be, you know, you've been to Elmina. You've stood in Elmina. You, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The Portuguese, them, them so-called, they call them castles. How y'all call this a damn castle? It's a dungeon. The hell are y'all talking about castles? But anyway, I understand tourism. Y'all got to be. But the point is this. They're looking for gold. And as they get gold in trade, they get strong enough, and then they and then they learn the currents, and they get farther and farther out in the ocean, farther and farther in that ocean, till they figure out how to go and come back, and that's how it happens. Because we, as we know, atmospheric scientists, y'all know this, even if you just watch the weather people, the hurricanes form off the coast of West Africa. The, the atmospheric patterns follow the ocean currents as well. So you see them, they, it comes back, it circles back around. Anyway, I started to say this. The question we had to ask ourselves with HBCUs and, 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 and black education in general is this. When did black people start educating our children? The answer is this, since the beginning of time. And so when you read how Howard French, or you look at some of the books we've talked about over the arc now of over a year and a half, as we're in our 84th consecutive, I'm very proud of that. We're doing this work. You see, in fact, W.E.B. Du Bois and The Education of Black People, which is the next book after we finish Siddle Walker's book, we'll be reading my education in Black America class. When he gives this talk, called, uh, well, I think it's education, it's an education at work, page 85. My man Du Bois not playing. These are talks he gave mostly at HBCUs, by the way. Du Bois said, I once saw a perfect system of education. It was under a tree in West Africa in a circle. These children and their teacher. He said, this is the, this is the thing. He's, he's going around the black colleges as early as the first decade of the 20th century. And the last talk he gives in there is 1960 at Johnson C. Smith in North Carolina, where he's trying to get black faculty at HBCUs to understand that education for black people cannot be an imitation of white schools. It cannot be that you just the best black imitation of a white curriculum. In fact, he's got a talk he gave at Fisk in 1933, the field and function of the Negro college. Oh my God. Du Bois is spitting as young people say bars bars. Do you understand? Du Bois is like, in France, a French university is French in character and, co and content. In England, an English university, Oxford, Cambridge, French, it's, it, it, it's English in content. He says, what is a Negro college in the United States? He told these people at Johnson C. Smith in 1960, he, the spring of 1960, just a month before the founding of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Dr. Du Bois said, this is what's going to happen. The laws are going to change. You're going to get equal rights, and then you're going to disappear. Because the question you will have to answer that you haven't even asked yet is, is the question of race and culture. How are you going to educate? Are you going to train your children to disappear into white society? Or are you going to make a significant contribution to modern society as your foremothers and fathers did to ancient and medieval society? Timbuktu, they was coming to Timbuktu. Them cats as Howard French, they coming down there looking for the genius of Africa. They used that genius, the material resources, even the maps the Moors left in the Iberian Peninsula, the Africans and the Arabs. They used that to build Europe. So he says, you got to shift the whole narrative of world history. You've been told a lie. This was not about uh, European genius. This wasn't about European explorers. This wasn't about European superior military technology. This was about y'all came to Africa and got a piggyback ride into the front of the line. And guess what? In 2021, it's already come apart. They fight. There was a thing in Poland now that like we talked about that during office hours last week. You know, they want to get out of Brexit, too. They're not going nowhere. But the English now, the supply chains are broken all over the world. The English are worried about imports and exports. They got to get a hand from the EU. The EU, I thought y'all wanted to leave. <laughs> anyway, the whole point is that it's coming apart. And in the United States, as the demographic changes coming down to Blackburn takeover. What you've seen is, and as Professor Carter writes, years ago, 50 years ago, she wrote it, didn't come out till 94, and she was at the end of a long career as a scholar at Shaw University, now completely invisible, even at Shaw, I'm sure, because HBCUs often have contempt for institutional memory and then want to know why they face the same problems. What she's saying is that the rising tide of protest at HBCUs has always been internal until the 60s when it goes public facing. Let me give you a very quick example. Ray Walters, new nigger on campus, what are they protesting in the 20s? What's Zora Neale Hurston and them mad at in the 20s? And Howard Zora Hurston, who was in school in them, they, you know where they mad? They mad in part because they got mandatory chapel. <laughs> and Zora Neale Hurston like, 
<laughs> Look, I'm religious. I love my people. But I'm not going because you make me go. You're not my dad. In other words, they're bristling against the idea that they got to be told what to do by these adults. I'll go if I want to go. At the same time, the white administrators at Howard are in beefing with the black faculty, Elaine Locke. Because guess what? According to the rules, the administrators say you got to pick some faculty to go over there and see if other faculty are going. Carter Woodson was on the faculty at Howard for a year and a half before he quit. He said, I can't do this no more. <laughs> Y'all, I can't do this. Why? You want me to go over to chapel and take attendance of faculty. Elaine Locke was Baha'i, by the way. He's in the Baha'i faith. Lane wow. Lockton, maybe I'll go for the music or maybe I won't go, but I, I ain't. You know, I saw the correspondence. It's in Morgan Spangar and Howard University, the research archive. Locke is like, whatever, man. Woodson is like, look, I got X number of days to be alive. Woodson resigned and went down on 9th Street back to his house and kept working at the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History that he had founded. I can't waste my time with these administrative pettiness. Lucy Diggs, slow, so important, this sister, the first dean of women at Howard, always beefing the president. This is the first black president of Howard, Mordecai Johnson, wants her to move on the campus because she's a dean of women. Okay, that seems reasonable until you realize that the men weren't required. The dean of men and other deans weren't required to live on campus. Lucy Diggs, slow, what? You just want me to... Yeah, okay, this is what I'm going to do. You see, listen, listen, uh, hold on. Let me, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> Lucy Diggs Slowhouse still in D.C. where she lived with her <laughs> partner. Lucy Diggs Slow was with her female partner who taught at what school did she teach at? Oh yeah, this one here. Dunbar High School. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Lucy Diggs Slow, y'all talk about respectability politics? Oh my God. Get uh what's my sister's name? April Sproul. Oh man, I can't I can't see the book. Did an excellent biography of Lucy Diggs Slow, who was also the uh one of the early black women tennis champions. I mean, she was bad. You know, don't think even uh Venus and Serena, of course, Zena Garrison, of course. You go back, don't even think Althea Gibson. You gotta go back to Lucy Diggs Slow to get into that. And we talked about her when we talked about um Althea Gibson, didn't we? Yes. No, 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 no. A librarian no, no. from Jersey. They were from Jersey. Right. Uh, no. Dorothy Porter. Dorothy Porter West. Wesley, yeah, right. That's right. But she was, in fact, the beef got so bad, Lucy Diggs Slow got sick. She passed away. Stress, all this kind of thing conspired. She died too early. Oh, one of the founders as well of Alpha Kappa Alpha. You know, haven't heard the vice president of the United States make any comments about Blackburn takeover. Anyway, the point is that she was one of the founders of the sorority that Kamala Harris belongs to, Alpha Kappa Alpha. Um, Lucy Diggs Slow, when she passed, her funeral was in Rankin Chapel. You know who was banned from coming to the funeral? The president of Howard University. <laughs> no, you can't come. <laughs> so, so, so what Dean, what Dr. Uh, Dr. Carter is talking about, there's a long internal tradition. By the 1940s, it's anti-lynching. Another figure we've been talking about enters the scene. A law student who went to undergrad at your esteemed college, which is why I'm so happy and I've encouraged you. Are you going to get that talk, that Polly Murray talk? Mm, maybe not. No, I don't know. I mean, I would lo I mean, right. I right. love that historical. Anyway, the point is this. As we all know, Professor Hunter teaches at, at, at Hunter College. And we all know now, increasingly more people know that the great Polly Murray went to Hunter College. And then she went to law school at Howard, in part because the University of North Carolina wouldn't accept her, and Harvard was like, well, we don't take women. Uh, so that's how she ended up at, at Hunter and ended up at Howard, but we glad she came to Howard. But she's at Howard enrolled. Remember, she's going south with her friend, her girlfriend, and they get on the bus and the segregation law, they say they're breaking the morality code, all this kind of thing. But one of the things they were combating in the 40s was anti-lynching. You know, she was heavy involved in the anti-lynching work. The Howard students are in that too. That's a public facing thing. But by the 1960s, this is where this book, Student Unrest at HBCUs comes in very importantly. You've got a widening group of black students who are first generation, but they are not, so they're not legacy. In fact, this is why I say Larry Morris's book is this is the guy, he's literally the chair of the Howard University Board of Trustees right now. Okay. 1986, he published Sundial. So while people are saying you're against black people, I have I don't doubt the motives of anybody in the governance structure who want to help black people. From the governance lens, you got to ask a question. Why do you think this is in the best interest of black people? So where Professor Taylor 
says that Howard's administration is hiding behind the history of the university to shroud its neoliberal corporatist agenda. I would say it's not hiding behind the history of university if you understand the history of HBCUs in general and Howard in particular. There's always been that trend. There, I mean, one of the reasons Howard's uh, motto got changed from equal rights uh, for all, equal rights and knowledge for all, which was the original uh, motto with this picture of white, black, Native American, Asians at a table, it got changed to veritas et utilitas, truth and utilitas is really not service in Latin. The way I understand it, it's more like being of service, having some utility. I mean, you see it right there in the word, you use your context clues. But anyway, it doesn't sound as good as truth and service. But the point is this, the it got changed in part because this is this is an attempt by Kelly Miller and others who was the first black dean, first dean of the School of Liberal Arts, now College of Arts and Sciences, to try to resolve the tension between liberal arts and vocational education and saying Howard is capable of both because Howard was founded for teachers and preachers because General Howard and them, who, by the way, knew General Armstrong at Hampton, knew General Clinton B. Fisk at Fisk, they're all involved in trying to shape education for black people. We don't trust black people to shape education. Well, I mean, maybe one day, but we got to get them up to speed, get their muscle memory up. You know, Samuel Armstrong is like, these Negroes are savages. I mean, we just got to train them. Meanwhile, some black people are like, you go to hell. John Mercer Langston, first dean of law school at Howard, was the president of Howard University for a year and a half on an interim basis. The white trustees like, we don't trust you. And then, according to Rayford Logan, who wrote the history of Howard University, and before that, uh, Walter Dyson, who wrote Howard University, the capstone of Negro education, you got black faculty telling the white trustees, yeah, I don't know about the guy Mercer. Yeah, because all skin folk ain't kin folk and their class tensions. Professor uh, Taylor may miss the point. And I don't know. I mean, again, it's a tweet. I know she knows this. But I also understand the power of saying what she said. Again, but this colorblind kind of critique is a problem because Howard ain't Princeton. Howard ain't Harvard. Howard ain't, because the nature of the student body, the nature of the administration, the nature of the faculty means that all of those impulses toward neoliberalism, toward suppressing thought, toward trying to be respectable, they're also commingled with the idea of advancing the race. These black people think this is the best way to do it. So it isn't, I don't question anybody's motives. I question their institutional memory and memory in general, because memory is what allows us to shape vision. And I also question whether or not you think black people can win. Mm -hmm. If you don't think black people can win as a group, not only do I sympathize with you, not only do I share that in the middle of the night when I'm looking at another bout of foolishness and thinking, that's it. Check, please. Uh, could I just get a doggy bag for the race? Because the American Negro's done. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let me pack all this stuff up and get to Ghana or South Africa or the Gambia somewhere and just get the thing set up and we can maybe regroup or I'm going to the Caribbean. But then you regroup and look at yourself and say, hey, it's all right. So when you see in Netflix case, it's dollars and cents. So they counted up the costs, right? But in the case of HBCUs and black institutions, it's more than dollars and cents, you see? And there are a lot of people who think it's just strictly dollars and cents who can get lost. And so if you're in a black institution and you're saying, well, this just makes good business sense. And then you give lip service to the other thing. But of course, we're here to defend the culture. We're here to defend, mm, you better go listen to Shirley Murdoch. <laughs> Should have counted up the cost, <laughs> but instead you got lost in the black mold, in the limited service from the place you took the children every minute, every second. But guess what? We all together. So as we lay, why? Because we're together. You see, that child who's sniffing in black mold, that's your niece. Now, I know she ain't your blood niece, but you best deal with this before, you know, your brother and sister come up here. Mm. Uh, they're known as the parents. And see, some of these Negroes are not fourth generation. Some of these Negroes is generation zero, since we talk about first generation. And they're not going to be satisfied with 15 emails to get a result or bonding together. They're just going to be like, what'd you say, baby? No problem. What off is that? And see, here's the problem because this is what student protests. In fact, there's a very, in fact, there's a very mm -mm. important book that. Oh, uh, what did I do with it? I thought I put. Ah, yeah. This is from the 1968 takeover at Howard Centennial Plus. 
a photographic and narrative account of the Black Student Revolution, Howard University, 1965 to 68. J.H. Printer Hughes. Here's Printer Hughes right here. This is for those who are on Black student newspapers, HBC student newspapers. You got to have institutional memory. So they do a whole thing, man. You had Karenga came on campus, Muhammad Ali, everybody. They're saying they want Howard University to be a Black school. He said, but it is Black. You Black people know by the 60s, what you is, Nathan Hare, the Howard University administration got rid of this guy. And he, what happened when he got kicked off the campus in part for helping students and thinking through stuff in sociology, he was he was let go from Howard. His contract was not renewed. And by the way, let me pause there and put a footnote on this because one of the issues at Howard is an issue that is everywhere in all the country, in all the universities in the country, the issue of contingent faculty. There are two types, as we know. Contingent faculty are those who are not tenured or on the tenure track. And that number of tenured or tenure track professors and universities in the United States is, is dovetailing. In fact, if you've been following the news the last couple of weeks, there are states trying to abolish tenure because they don't want nobody to have tenure. And by the way, tenure is not a guarantee of a job for life. Tenure is a guarantee of due process. Due process is basically, uh, I'm going to give you a meal before I help you. But the whole point, in other words, hey, did you eat? Yes, you're fired. No, I'm just saying, and then you get a lawyer if you got the stamina. This kind of thing. So don't think, y'all don't think, oh, professors got tenure jobs. That means get a job for life. No. Nah. Now you'll read some of these faculty handbooks, particularly the ones that are being renegotiated. But the point is that there's, the, but that's better than contingent faculty. There's a book by a brother who's at Georgetown. I say brother, he's a he's a professor, classicist um, at J Jacques Berliner Blau. At, in fact, I went to see him when this book was released. I went to see the book launch. It's called Campus Confidential. How College Works or Doesn't for Professors, Parents, and Students, Jacques Berliner Blau. And what Berliner Blau talks about is, for example, let me give you some numbers. This is from 2017. It's worse now. At the super elite schools, the numbers vary greatly. At Harvard, 33.3% of the faculty are contingent. At Yale, it's 53.3%. At Columbia, it's 61.5%. Then again, Princeton is at 29.9% and Stanford is stunningly low, 8.4%. At my school, Georgetown, the number is 68.3%. Now, I've, I've, I've given talks to faculty at HBCUs where I went through the numbers for HBCUs, which are difficult because they don't always collect the numbers in the same way. Contingent faculty means adjuncts, getting paid as low as $2,500 or $2,000 a class, maybe as high as five to $7,500 a class. If you're teaching violin in a fine arts program and you are a working musician in a philharmonic somewhere and you're coming to give violin lessons, you might get paid $7,500 a, a semester to teach the violin class to two or three students or five or six students. You're very limited. If you're an English professor at a place like Howard or Hampton or Morehouse and you're an adjunct, you might be getting paid $2,500 or $3,000 a semester for per class to teach a class with 30 students, 40 students, 50 students. And if you're doing that, that means that if you've got four classes that you're teaching at $3,000 a piece, do the math, $12,000 for over full-time work and you're grading every paper, there's no assistance. And you might be teaching four other classes at re at community colleges just to be able to pay for the gas and, your, and there's no benefits. That's what they call contingent faculty. Those percentages that I just read, those are contingent faculty. It isn't just them. It's also graduate students. You might be teaching a class. I was a grad TA. The A part was a joke. I wanted to teach. I've been teaching at the university level since I was a first semester graduate student at Ohio State. I was on full scholarship, meaning I didn't have to get paid. And I didn't want the money. I wanted to teach. I was in the class. I graduated from law school in May 2000. In September 2000, I was in the classroom at Ohio State as a master's student, having finished my law degree in Black Studies. Sat and talked to Manning Marable that spring, brother, myself and Belithia Watkins, my friend, who's now on faculty at Howard. We went and we sat with Manning Marable. Oh, yeah. Came in. Marable had gone to Columbia by then. No, Colorado, then Columbia. But the point is this. The professor who's supposed to be teaching the class, who will remain nameless, walked in, said, everybody's good. Everybody on the roster. OK, listen to him. I'll see y'all later. That was it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now, I was OK because I was 25 years old. I had already, I already had a professional degree and I had been teaching little children. I had taught some high school students. I, mean, I knew what I was doing. Imagine if you're 23, a brand new graduate student, 22, and you get thrown in and you're in a space like that. That's what happens at a lot of these HPCUs. At a place like Howard, you might have a graduate student who's teaching speech, for example, in school of communications, meaning they're not even getting the stipend. They're getting, they're getting tuition. They may get a graduate stipend. 
But again, when you give a gift or you have a federal appropriation or you have tuition money, the question students want to know is, if I'm paying this money, is it going to my TA? Is it going to my adjunct? And so what you see is administrative issues become a very big issue because administrators got to pay for the lights, got to pay for the grass getting cut, got to pay for the insurance, got to be careful about this, and got to pay the faculty. And, and, and when increasingly at universities in general, go back again to Ivory Tower, the documentary or Scott Galloway's book, Post Corona, you're paying star faculty these are the people be on tv these people talking who if you gave a paper to them and said grade it they would break down and weep like a baby <laughs> this is my point they're not doing that and so they're the people who would talk to me and i have friends and colleagues look at me like are you a fool what you still you still teaching class them numbers why are you doing it i said because i didn't come here and now you've come here but i gotta probably give you this directive you should have counted up the cost, but instead you got lost in the branding, in the flexing, and now you realize <laughs> you got to lay with us too. Why? Because you at a black school now. Mm. And so black schools and celebrity faculty is probably going to be like oil and water. Unless, again, shout out to Felicia Rashad, you come to work every day because people say she ain't coming to work. Oh, shit, there she go. Okay, <laughs> wait a minute. There she go again. He ain't coming away. Oh, you over at the, you over at San Cope eating your lunch, man. I ain't seen what is that? Is that Felicia Rashad? And she ain't she not coming in with the Claire Huxtable gear. She ain't coming in flowing in the robes. She coming in like your auntie. Yeah. See, this is somebody building credibility because it's beyond the lights now. It's on the strength. And so these are the kind of faculty and administrators that somebody take a bullet for. But guess what? If you're if you're in, if you care about our children, ain't nobody going to hurt you. But and I've seen this happen. This is where I'm going to go with this. These young people here, they protested one of their demand. They closed the administration building. In fact, oh, my God, this is probably the most famous piece in here. It's it's one of the final pieces in here. I'm just going to show you all this because this got put in Henry Hampton's Eyes on the Prize. You read John Elsa's book, True South. This is in front of the, <laughs> this is in front of the A building. My point is, one of their demands, the president got to go. President mm -hmm. got to. The president was Jim Nabrit. Jim Nabrit out of Texas was one of the lawyers who who was formerly the dean of Howard Law School before he was secretary of the university before he came to president. Jim Nabrit was one of the lawyers who argued Brown versus Board of Education. See, the thing about generations is, what have you done for me lately? You, it plays. <laughs> it's a cycle. <laughs> and they look, they ran Jim Neighbor into retirement. The guy who came after James Cheek. Oh, this is where you got to get uh, the new book edited by Charles Jarman on Andrew Billingsley and Howard University in the 1970s. This is where you get the history of what happened at Howard. They brought in as best they could the black university. They hired all these young black faculty, Ron Walter, Joyce Ladner, you know, um, um, my man who just became an ancestor. Oh, I see his face. Ralph Goons. I mean, you you name it. All these great, incredible faculty come in. How are we going to be a black university? Because these kids said this black face stuff, no more. No, nah, black university. Cheek comes in like gangbusters. He's like 34 years old. The Cheek brothers, King Cheek, ended up being president of Morgan State. J uh, James Cheek, he came out of North Carolina, Shaw University, same Shaw we were talking about. Up here, first few years, gangbusters doing all kinds of stuff. They start all these institutes. If you want to know about the history of black HBCUs, get Lorenzo Morris, who's retired now, but he was on family when I joined. Elusive Equality, the Status of Black Americans in Higher Education. This book was published, Howard University Press. They started a press. They started all these institutes. This is from the Institute for the Study of Educational Policy. They said black people should have a black university with a black press and black research institutes. The Institute of Music, Donald Byrd, the musician, starts jazz studies and fine arts. You got it. I mean, that's why you got to get Charles Jarman's book, which I was honored to write the forward to because I called Andrew Billingsley after I was made chair of African Studies during the time I was chair. That's one of my first calls. I said, Dr. Billingsley, who was chilling, Billingsley, hey man, would you consider being uh, a, a, James, a, a John and Eula Cleveland chair? We had a little bit of money from two elders who left it to us in their will and we used that money to put support into him he called this huge conference for his 90th birthday shout out to him his partner amy billingsley the billingsley family and you saw these legends larry gary these legends eleanor trailer these legends come in joyce ladner these legends come in dory ladner these legends come in and talk about social work and mathematics I and mean, how do you they're gonna make it black cheeks start off like gangbusters by 1989 is the number another something <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha.
my man Josh Myers, who's on faculty at Howard, my former student who's now written a brilliant book, We Are Worth Fighting For, a history of the Howard University student protests of 1989. One of the demands, Ras Baraka, April Silver. You know what one demand? Cheat gotta go. What? What have you done for me lately? Cheek <laughs> gets increasingly conservative. By 1989, in league with his contacts in the Republican Party, deeply concerned. Now, under James Cheek, that Howard University got and still has the only HBCU with a public television network station, WHUT, WHUR, where the geniuses of WHUR, including people like Kojo Nandi, create Kojo Nandi, who used to work at Drum and Spear Bookstore, coming out of Student Nonviolent Coordinate Committee and affiliated people, Black Power Movement, Marion Barry, all them. They create something that we may have heard before called the quiet storm. It came out of WH. Cheek is doing, he's doing great, but as he gets more conservative, because why? I'm looking at the bottom line in terms of money. I'm buying property. We're going to flip this. We're going to be making this money. But you should have counted up the larger cost. The larger cost is more than dollars and cents because HBCUs, this is where I say uh, uh, Kianga Yamada probably missed this. Yes, there's neoliberalism. Yes, there's a corporate agenda. Yes, Cheek had one. But it's also draped in black and try, the, the central contradiction from the history of education of black people in this country is, as Du Bois said, you didn't bring forward the Africa because they, they cut your memory off. But we can recover that memory. But if you don't recover that memory and decide who you're going to be, you're going to be drifting around in this social structure with no thing. And since they removed the hedge of segregation, mm. the central dilemma in education in this country including the HBCUs, has been the unresolved tension between what it means to be Black and what it means to be a useful component of an American field of violence that includes neoliberalism and capitalism, and those tensions are unresolved. So I'm saying all this finally to say this. By the time these students come together in 1989 for their protests, Ras Baraka is one of the leaders, as I say, he's not a mayor of Newark. It's a Mary Baraka's son, Mary Baraka who never finished Howard. Because he said these petty bourgeois Negroes, I cherry picked the faculty I listened to. One was Sterling Brown. Sterling Brown, who got quotes all up and down Larry Morse's, the chair of Howard's uh, board of trustees, all up and down his book. He starts so many of these chapters with Sterling Brown quotes. When the students took over the building in 1968, they said one of the things we want to do is get rid of this white man's name. We want to rename this school. Maybe we can rename it Sterling Brown University. Mm -hmm. After King was killed, Morehouse, Spellman, uh, Morris Brown, Land University, and the Interdenominational Theological Seminary, they come together, center, they come together and say to the trustees and the leadership at, at, at the Atlanta University schools, y'all can stay presidents, y'all can stay the board, but we want to merge these schools in a different formation and call them all the Martin Luther King University. And it was like, hell no. We're not <laughs> so Vincent Harding, professor in the history department at Spelman, Stephen Henderson, professor of English, he, they, them two, along with some younger scholars, you probably heard some of these names. Let me think of one we may have all heard who's now elder. Oh, yeah. Um, Jeanetta Cole. They formed something called the Institute of the Black World. Howard Dotson, who ran the Schomburg for years. They set it up in a house across the street from Morehouse because you can't change the HBCU. There's a deep conservatism in it because part of the roots go back to making themselves of service to the white economy. And trying to uplift the race, which quickly, and this is where I agree with Kenyaga Yamada, fractures into a class, intra-racial, governance structure, class conflict between that small group. And this is where Larry Morris's book is so important. Morris traces the current chair of Howard's board. Morris, who graduated from Howard in the early 70s, 73. Morris, who writes in 86, a whole book, a fictionalized account, basically of his time at Howard and other people. In fact, he got this character in here named Lisa, who I think is Felicia Rashad. I can't prove it. But anyway, I had to ask him one day. But this arts person who's deeply committed in the culture, the, the main character in here is from Jersey. His daddy went to Howard. Granddaddy went to Howard. He's, you know, he's kind of three to several generations. His, his, his roommate, I think, in uh, Drew Hall was like a first generation cat. He's they, they all into the black power thing, dashikis, they changing their names. There's this huge event that happens the two thirds of the way through the book that changes everybody's lives. And then the main character goes to visit his uh, uh, his grandfather's friend. Cause he, this guy knew his grandfather, but he never knew his grandmother. So he's going to see this guy. This, this guy's name, Martin Light. I am convinced the Martin Light character is Sterling Brown. 
Sterling Brown, who by the time he left Howard was so disillusioned with Howard that as Nathan Hare, who got put off the Howard University faculty because his contract wasn't renewed, ah, contingent, where'd he go? He went to San Francisco State. And when you read the histories of black studies, they say the first black studies program was founded at San Francisco State University in 1968. Uh, it was founded by Nathan Hare. Yeah, because the students shut down San Francisco State. This is during the period of student unrest around the, the world, really. Go to France, 1968. Czechoslovakia, 1968. In the country, United States, it's a lot of anti-war stuff. The HBCUs, they get Martin, I'm sorry, they get Marvin, uh, mm -hmm. they get Hare, Dr. Hare, to come, Nathan Hare, Nathan and Julia Hare, by the way, she's made transition, he's still alive. Nathan Hare comes, starts the Black Studies program at San Francisco State, but he could have started the one at Howard, but them Negroes won't go handle no Black Studies at Howard. It took him another 20 years to get African American Studies as a required class to take. And even that was a challenge. We'll have to talk about that another day. I mean, we're running out of time. I want to tie this together. I'm, I'm kind of beginning to weave it together now. But if when you read Larry Morse's book, Morse's character goes to sit with this elder professor, the Sterling Brown character off campus, who has seen it all. Brown, who by the end of his life, Sterling Brown, they gave Sterling Brown a little office around the corner from where my office is right now on the third floor of Founders. And they always saying, we're going to greet y'all to upgrade in offices and African American studies like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved. Hmm. I want y'all to hear that. I want you to hear it loud and clear. Black studies is the only discipline in the university, black, white, or polka dot that was created out of student protest. The students demanded it in 68. I tell you students all the time, I wouldn't have a job. I chose my major. I'm not in history. I'm not in literature. I'm not in philosophy. Hiding out to make sure I had my economic viability. And then I write something black and say, I'm doing Africana studies. It's a lie. But it's okay because now we have Nubia narrative and we're doing it in class and we're doing the classes over here. We're not even talking about y'all. This is a detour on what we would normally do. Because we pour clean glasses of water, but we had to jailbreak the black university. In other words, we ain't going back to the university as it was. All right, as I was saying, around the corner from my little office is on the third floor. And the reason we're in the in the library on the third floor is because they had empty offices over there because the rooms are so small. They used them as study carols, secondary offices for faculty who had offices other places. They gave Sterling Brown a little office on the other side of the hall in the back room, little office. And Brown would come and still have office hours. Jules Harrell tells us this all the time. Dr. Harrell, my man. So on faculty at Howard. I said, I'd like to say this. By the end, Sterling Brown was so disillusioned that Nathan Hare was in town one time to see him. They said, uh, Brown has been admitted to the hospital. He went to the hospital to see him. And he writes this in Negro Digest. Nathan Hare said, I went on the floor and down the hall, I seen Sterling Brown. Sterling Brown said something to the nurse and stood there, turned around. The nurse walked up to me and said, Mr. Brown, wanted to know whether you are affiliated with Howard University. He said, I was. He said, he don't want to see nobody from Howard University. <laughs> and went back in his office because that's how he felt to have been mistreated. So can this faculty administration thing, it goes back. But here's what Larry Moore says when he goes to visit this professor, Martin Light, the Sterling Brown character. He says, these things have happened before over there, you know. I suppose your grandfather has told you all about that. About what, professor? The demonstrations, the strikes, the protests we took part in when we were students. The old order and the new Negroes, the new Negro on campus. He says, no, no, he never said anything about that to me. Professor Light says, there was a difference, however. Then we knew who our enemies were and likewise our friends. Kids over there now want to see everything in color. Our troubles had nothing to do with the fact that Durkee was white. Durkee is the one that caused the beef that ended up, the anyway, the last white president before the first black one. There were white presidents before him, and they had been of different fiber and a different magnitude. We could have been green. He could have been green for all we cared. The fact was he was an exceptionally narrow-minded, intolerant man who neither understood or cared about who we were, what our hopes and aspirations were, and the role that institutions had in play, always played in forming and furthering them. Even worse, he made no attempt to find out. He fired Carl G. Woods in our sophomore year, then in 24. True. Your grandfather would have been in the medical college then. He fired Elaine Locke, my father, and a few others. I was away at the time. Things got so bad here, you know, that it became a front page national issue. He goes on. The point I'm trying to make is Morse's point of the book, in Morse's mind, at least as articulated in this book, things are a cycle. Time is a cycle. In my mind, I agree with him 100%. 
But here's where we have the challenge that has led these young people into Blackburn for the Blackburn takeover. One that I suspect, if it continues, is going to spread to other HBCUs because I've seen these solidarity statements from all of the campus organizations at Howard. I'm seeing solidarity from Alabama State. Hampton apparently is having a solidarity uh, thing event this weekend. Morehouse has sent something. I'm seeing solidarity statements from everybody at Howard from the uh, bar, Student Bar Association at the law school wanting to send over legal observers, law students. I'm saying, oh, this looks like the white school because that's what we did at the white school. That's what we did at Ohio State to keep that damn administration off of our black undergraduate kids. We felt like they're older brothers and sisters. We go in the room with you. They ain't going to throw you out of school because the white girl touched your hair. And without asking, because y'all roommates and she ain't never seen no hair like that. No, you're not getting put out of school. I'm looking at these black law students at at uh, at, 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 uh, at, uh, at Howard saying they're in solidarity. I'm saying, oh, what is going on? Then, I, then the faculty senate center, I'm saying, oh, oh. what you're witnessing now is, a, is, as Professor Carter said years ago, an internal conflict that has always been there that goes back as far as Jim Anderson writes to when these black students came out of slavery, went to Hampton and wrote home like I came here to learn math and they got me painting fifth post nine hours a day and reading the damn Bible. This is not why I came to school. You got I mean, so in other words, it's an internal conflict with increasingly class conflict that every generation finds a way to have. But now, finally, we are in the 21st century. And because we're in the 21st century with a changing demographic in this country, with competing interests, with the unsustainability of the university model as we have it, we are at an inflection point where this ain't even going to be like 2018. COVID has renegotiated the term. Mm -hmm. Two generations of teenagers at all the universities in the country who were in their pajamas taking Zoom class this time last year, who are now, and it's like black mold? Hell no, nah. I pay 28 G's basic tuition, room board and everything else. Now it's 50 stacks and my roommate, her parents can write the check. Me, my mom and them looking like we got enough money for you to get there for a year and bust your ass with a 4.0 and try to get on scholarship. By the way, are there more scholarships being offered now? Because we saw that they gave y'all $40 million. Then you got $20 million. Then you got $5 million. Then you got $10 million. Don't check out the federal corporation. We understand, understand Biden and Harris put some more money. But where's the money for my daughter's scholarship? We had enough money to get her there for a year. Those young people are our children. And there's nobody, Larry Morris, the president of the university, Wayne Freddie, there's no me, you, there's nobody who who is not moved when you see that conversation. Now, the question is, what are the hell are we going to do about it? What the hell are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And as you see, this ain't the first rodeo we've been at. This is the this is the this is the this is one of the central dilemmas of HBCUs. So it ain't just Howard. Whew. Um there are so many questions and comments in the in the chat here at Nubia. Uh, I want to shout out Tony, who has a daughter there. She's now a junior. She All said, right, Tony. And, yeah, in her first year, um, Tony said that she was subjected to staying in a quad of an all-girls dorm that had been renovated but wasn't 100% complete. There were fire alarms that went off randomly all times of the day in the middle of the night. The dorm had been flooding. She said while her room was never flooded, she had to walk through the corridors where, of course, there was water and there were men working in the building and countless fire alarms. Yes. The this fire year. alarms are serious business, y'all. These fire alarms have been going off all the time at Howard. I'm not telling y'all what I heard, okay? Because these kids come to class. They woke up in the middle of the night. It goes off in the daytime. That right there, fix it. And she's among one of the uh, many Howard students who's unhoused right now. And she said, you know, God knows we had to pay her rent. It was sacrificially. She said, only good thing going on for me this year is that she gets to sit at the feet of a master teacher. No. Which I is you. So, <laughs> so let me ask this, this question, because a lot of people are sending their children to Howard because of the superstars that are there. Um, and superstars just, whose names are there. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, you know. <laughs> Let me well, just because I, I mean, I take, I take. I, it's real personal to me. I know. I know faculty who, you know, we know faculty who who work who are there all the time, and so, and I'm not talking. I'm not. I'm not casting shade on nobody, but I'm just saying, don't be flexing. We take that very seriously. We take that very. Don't be a virtue hoarder. Mm. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. 
so there's a question, you know, should we send our children to these schools? Should we, you know, what should the choice be? And I feel like, you know, what we do here every Saturday and then Monday we have office hours. I want to go through the book propaganda with Ed Bernays because I yes. signed yes. my students uh, both classes that I have. You have 11 classes. I have two. Um, and I want to assign it to Nubians as well because, you know, as you're talking, we you, you talk about curation quite frequently. Yes. Let's really talk about the birthing of curation in this in this country that we live in. But should we send our kids to these schools? And I think, you know, if you send your child to a school with the foundational knowledge of who they are, with the foundational knowledge of, of how, you know, what the entry points are, how things are being curated, then we can go, they can go and extract what they need to get to fortify the things that they want to do instead of going, assuming that they're learning foundational knowledge or getting foundational knowledge. What are your, your thoughts on that in terms of? The answer we're... is yes. Yes, of course. Okay. I mean, it was very different for me. Um, I was not a, I was not an efficient student as, as a high school student. I graduated from Hillsborough High School in Nashville, Tennessee with like a 2.5. I was more interested in the band than playing baseball. I was captain of the baseball team, drum major to band. I wanted to go to Tennessee State to be in the marching band. They had open enrollment. So if you went to a public, if you went in public HBCU Negroes like me, I tell my students all the time, I drank the blue Kool-Aid of Tennessee State, just like y'all drinking that Howard blue Kool-Aid, that sensibility politics that wants you to make family business family business. I understand it. But they had open enrollment. If you had a C average, you could come to NC State. But the tuition was $400. And I worked at Crystal's. I worked at Arby's. I worked at Wendy's. I was able, and my parents, working class people. But, you know, they helped me. I paid. And once I got there, I stood on the steps of the student center the day I got admitted. And I said, you know what? My GPA is 0.0. .0. Don't nobody know me here. <laughs> I bust my ass to get a scholarship. I became the president of the honors program at Tennessee State at a high ACT score. But I'm saying this is the point I'm trying to make with that. It's different times now. Public HBCUs are much more affordable. And this is why you got to vote and you got to be in policy making and get these white clan, these white nationalist lawmakers in the South where most of our HBCUs are and these public schools that are trapped by these legislatures that owe them millions. Tennessee State, the tally could be over 500 million. Delaware, I mean, uh, uh, Maryland just came up off 500 and something million. They have a black woman in charge of the legislature in, in, in Maryland. You get Voting matters. You can turn those schools, uh, FAM and, and Grambling and Southern, these schools are the most affordable. Now, the private schools, the, the Howards, the Spelmans, the Morehouses, the Fisks, Still very important if you can afford it, go, but we need to get them more resources. We do need to do that because they need to be able to do scholarships too. And I see our, our girl Jackie in the chat. She reminds me mm -hmm. in Africa, these are two important books. His Roads Must Fall because, you know, the students in the University of Cape Town, and every time we go to South Africa, I take students, we stay on the campus of UCT and go back and forth to the Western Cape, the HCCU, the historically colored college university, so to speak. And, uh, so we're at Smith's Hall. Every morning I get up and spit on that Cecil Rhodes statue. I can't anymore. The, the black students got into UCT after apartheid and said, Rhodes must fall. That statue, and once they said Rhodes must fall, shoot, them nigga Rhodes was all. We just getting warmed up. Fees must fall. <laughs> In other words, they said, and you're going to take these damn prices down. And just like we did at Ohio State with action, these African students said, oh, no, we're together. Because these black women and these black men that clean up around here and, and the black faculty who you abuse and the blacks, we're all like this. And they formed even a multiracial coalition, University of Svastafan. In fact, watch the documentary, Everything Must Fall. But should we go to the schools? Absolutely. Because I'm going to tell you what else happened. Du Bois predicted it. You didn't say this. The HPCUs after Jim Crow was over, after they were able to admit black students, they said, oh, my God, we hate you coming to the University of Georgia. Uh, uh. Charmaine Hunter, we hate you. We hate you coming to Ole Miss. James Meredith, damn it. Okay, they in, no problem. Damn, okay, here we go. It's over, okay, no problem. Here are the blacks we want, curation. I need them fast-ass football players. Uh, that would be Bear Bryant at the University of Alabama after he got his ass handed to him by USC. There's a whole book about it, there's a whole documentary about it. Uh, that would be everybody in the slave economic concern. And here we are in 2021. If you black at an SEC school, you an athlete or a 4.0. <laughs> now there may be there are a handful of others who are in there, right? But the whole point is this, that's what integration meant. Meanwhile, if you're at Fort Valley, 
Shout out to my friend, uh, Berletha Pitts, my classmate, who is now at Fort Valley State University. If you are at an HBCU that is private, paying college, Augusta, Georgia, where Kathy Adams used to teach, who's now doing incredible work at Claflin, another private HBCU in South Carolina, or Sam Livingston and Corey Claiborne at and Morehouse, Tanya Clark and them, uh, my man, Daniel Black at Clark Atlanta University. These are private schools. You are looking at choices that have to be made based on endowments, based on contributions, based on tuition. And we've got to support our black schools. But should you send your children there? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is not to say that if you can't send them there, you shouldn't send them anywhere. Because guess what? The most affordable college for black students is in Georgia. In fact, it graduates the greatest number of black students anywhere of any university in, in the country, including any of the HBCUs. It graduates more black students every year than any HBCU, several thousand. It's in Atlanta and it's cheap. It's a public school. Shout out to my man, Akinyeli Umoja, my colleague, Stephanie Evans, who broke her heart, but she and her husband left Clark Atlanta, came over Georgia State University. Mm. In other words, it's over y'all. If we don't support our HBCUs, they're going to go away. And I don't mean they're going to close because after the Civil War, many of the public HBCUs between the end of the Civil War and then the first and second Moral Land Grant Act by the first quarter of the 20th century, the HBCUs in the South, many of the public HBCUs were placed in state capitals. Tallahassee, Florida a &M, Nashville, Tennessee State, Jackson, Mississippi, Jackson State. Why? Because that's where black people were migrating. But now... Guess what? Hmm. White people saying, well, hell, the tuition is cheap. We can know about So that's how you see the criminal enterprise, the University of Maryland College Park got in by continuing mm -hmm. to duplicate programs, violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Why? Because the, it, the decision was made to give Morgan State the executive MBA program. It's down the street from Annapolis, meaning white people don't have to move into dorms. They can take their lunch breaks or come off the, off the state of the hill of the state legislature and take classes at Morgan and put those. And then Maryland was like, that's cool. We're going to do one, too. He said, you violated the federal law. We don't give a damn sue us. They did. $577 million to Morgan, to Coppin, to University of Maryland Eastern Shore, formerly Maryland State College, to Bowie State University. The state HBCUs, for me, if you ain't got no money, the state HBCUs are the move for you. If you're from out of state, come the first year, family sacrifice, do what you need to do, donate, get people to give money to public schools. And then bust your ass, get a scholarship. The private ones, if that's if Howard is your dream school, come on. But I tell you what, the other side of the ledger is this: when you get to Howard, and we get up in the pretty opening ceremonies and we swag surfing and we give y'all pins with the Howard seal, it's all nice. That's an oath to your mom, and then we're gonna take care of you. That's right. If we don't take care of you, come see us. And some of you thug life Negroes know what I mean with them three words: come see us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because we done violated the oath. And in the governance structure, that's more than a contract. That's a blood oath. We owe to you and our ancestors and the yet unborn. If we're not treating your children right, come see us. Don't be don't be hiding it like the uh the problematic uncle at Thanksgiving. I was I was just thinking, you know, um, we have to support the HBCUs so that they maintain, you know, their status, but we also we must hold them accountable so that they can be do better it's yes. up to us to make sure that they do better we have to make them do better that's right so um and there's a couple of parents in there talking about the mold i think one um who's a, uh i can't remember i can't see her name but uh her daughter had to go into a hotel just so she could breathe you know like yeah whoa, do better. Whoa. no 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 uh-uh yeah. i'm gonna tell y'all now i mean and again i you know what karen i must say this i i feel no this is that's no it's not no self serving thing. It's, it's not, I don't mean it self-servingly, but I'm not going to say it that way. I'm going to say this. If my niece called, if Eden called, she's too young now. She called and said, Unk, Black Mole, I need a... I bet, oh, that's not a problem, baby. We're not paying for a hotel. You staying at the president's house tonight. <laughs> and then, you know, we'll work out however many days you got to stay there until your room is cleaned, but we're not spending a dime. We already paid the money, baby. Now, a question I have to ask myself sitting here with you is why I'm not, not doing that right now mm -hmm. with these other children. That's a problem for me as a man, not as a man, as a human being, 
And I'm saying it's not just my problem. It's the problem of everybody there. I'm saying I shouldn't be feeling like that alone. Right, right, like, right. What does that say about us that when we, this is acceptable? That's how we started this. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. So anywhere, anywhere, so, period. Hoppin State, Ohio right. State, Howard, Harvard, it's unacceptable for any child. Let's not even, you know, I'm with Kenya, uh, I'm with Kim, uh, her on that. I'm with Professor Tell. It's unacceptable for any child. This neoliberal model of education, it's over. All right. Uh, I also want to shout out Michael Harriet. He did a piece called A Conspiracy of Whiteness. Did an ESPN insider's email inadvertently reveal how the NFL blackballed uh, Colin Kaepernick. He do, even does a little uh, history of, of the word blackball. I love this piece so much. And, and I hope we can pick it up on Monday as we talk about that criminal enterprise uh, as well. And how, how about that? Yes. I, I oh, and, you know, we give credit where credit is due. I must say, I saw a story this week where. Sean Carter and them are paying for some stuff because there's this road cop in Kansas City who've been out there who's preying on black women, sleeping with them, forcing them. Got one boy was on uh, serving life for a murder he didn't commit because the because the guy's mom wouldn't have sex with him. But apparently Jay Z and them they're funding the challenge that led to the investigation of this guy. Now it still don't get you off the hook for that NFL shenanigans, but. I'm just saying it's it's common. No, but again, it goes back to that accountability. Sometimes you know people do the things that they think are right, you know, that's in the exactly moment. Right. And it's up to us to say, yo, no, you can do better. And that's not actually helping us over there. That that Super Bowl thing. This is what we require. That's if right. you're gonna come out and be that person, I think they want to do do well. I think they want to do I the agree. right thing, but we have to not just bitch about them behind the scenes, tell them. I Tell agree. Them out front. I agree. Oh, look, John Carwell said he had the experience of black mold at Florida. Uh, oh, Fayetteville State. Yeah, it's not just and understand, particularly with HBCUs, often there haven't been new dorms built in years. There haven't been new buildings done. That that's that deferred maintenance bill is in the hundreds of millions at a lot of HBCUs. That's why for the public ones, bang on these legislatures. There's money that has to be put. You have to, you can't just build a building, you got to keep right. it up. And and that's why you got to have administrators too, who not only have institutional memory but have expertise. It's not an on the job. I was say, job. Not have a poverty mentality because there's so many people that hit the lotto that go broke because they don't have uh, the you know academics are necess aren't necessarily the best people to be stewards over money. That's right. And I'll say that as well. And and and, and, and great people with money shouldn't necessarily be running higher it's, education. It's, yes, yes. Church and state. I mean, there's a lot. That needs to be done. That's right. You know, we have some answers, so we'll just keep we'll keep pressing on this because those children deserve all of all yes, the they do. They came there for a reason. Let's give them everything that they deserve. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Hey, look, I love you. I know we gotta go because we gotta too. get this up for the yeah. and, and 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 I'm gonna tell y'all now. You got me so fired up. I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna go check on these young people. I can't look, y'all. I, I, I will say I'm the first in my family to go to college. I have contempt for petty bourgeois mentality. I'm sorry, some of y'all, you know, elitists, whatever. I got contempt for it. I would have been one of them people in Larry Morse's brilliant novel, The Sundial. Sundial basically is the is the place at Howard University where students meet. I would have been one of them Nick Rose that he was kind of clowning. But guess what? If you're gonna clown me, you better read 28 hours a day. Cause I'm up somewhere because my whole commitment is to the race, but I got a commitment to the race that came out of the field. Do you understand? I don't give a damn about you, bourgeois Nick Rose. And guess what? The only thing I have more contempt for than a bourgeois Negro is the field of white violence that made you a bourgeois Negro. So this ain't even, I love you still. The thing I hate is a system that made bourgeois Negroes. That I would have hated bourgeois Negroes in Egypt though. So let's be clear. Right. I would have been against no. the Pharaoh. So I mean, let's be clear. That put people in a position to beat their own. You oh know, my that, God. That, that gave you something you know, for that, you know, that you, that forced you into thinking that in order to go, climb ahead, you got to do it on the backs of other black people. You can't make that. Yeah, that, that I, mean, I know we got to go, but I mean, yeah. I've seen the masters. We both seen them. The masters, the masters who trained Bill Roden went to Morgan State, but you never hear Bill Roden start any conversation without talking about Sam Lacey. I mean, the oh, masters God. sacrificed. Y'all got to understand. When the met, I mean, you know, the institution you teach at at Hunter, it ain't all HBCU. John Henry Clark was on that faculty. Marimba Ani was on the faculty at Hunter College, Black and Puerto Rican Studies. Those, some of them people still around. When I was at Tennessee State, Jamie Williams, McDonald Williams, Dury Cox, uh, Lois McDougal, uh, Hoyt King, I could go down the list. These were my teachers. They came, they, 
They felt American apartheid. And they said, if you come here, you got an obligation. Julian Blackshear gave me law classes before I ever walked in Ohio State. I don't take no back seats to nobody. You come to my class, my expectation is you didn't come here for clout chasing, damn it, or your individual advancement. You came here to advance the race. We are in a war. This is not fun and games, which is why, you know, I'm proud of these young people because I know that many of them came here for the clout chasing. But when you come into a HBCU, you're going to be gone in four or five years. Students are transitory. There's something about being in contact with all those different ideas. One of the reasons why I love Larry Morris's book, Sundial, he gives a full, robust conversation. Every type of idea you have, Stokely Carmichael said this, that Howard, you will find everything in the black world and its opposite. These are the four years where you get to grow. We got to protect these children. So they children who came to Howard believe in something with their whole heart, who in four years will come out believing the exact opposite with their whole heart. <laughs> I mean, that's why you go to a black college. Um, anyway. To be continued. Uh, yeah, we'll see y'all in, in the Nubian streets on Monday yeah. uh, office hours. Oh, tomorrow, Dr. Sanyata Amen, we're going to be starting Maroon's Medicine Chest in Nubia. Yes. Live. We're going to go live at noon just for the Nubians. We're going to be tell, telling y'all about it. She's got some plans. I love her. So Dr. Sanyata will be with us tomorrow in yes. Nubia at noon. So thank you, Dr. Carr. No, thank, no, thank you, thank you, and thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. I mean, I say Doc because that's the you right. know we call we all call, call each other Prof. Prof is the highest role of HBCUs. I learned that as an eighteen year old when I saw them. They called each other Prof because the band people didn't have doctorates, and so everybody called it the theater people didn't have doctorates. Professor is the highest title you can give to a faculty member in in the governance structure because it ain't about degrees; it's about what you do. So I want to thank you, Professor, because. Thank you. What this is this right here? When COVID hit, you, your wheels started spinning, and now we have a place where all these conversations we're having about HU and and Blackburn takeover and HBCUs, it's not necessary to have that conversation here. We build this place. Promise you, one of the unanticipated benefits is all those other places going to change. And shout out to all them people who may be hate watching on YouTube from these safe academic enclaves. I know some of my friends who hate watch. And guess what? Don't be mad. Don't be Come mad. To death. Come Wait, to death. Hold on. Competition should breed excellence. Well, yeah, but I'm not. But this ain't no competition. We just point and clean glass of water. We said, come to death row. I mean, without all the other stuff. I mean, just come on. Come on. Cornell's with us. If corn can come, y'all can come. Come on. <laughs> I love you. I love you. Love, love everybody. We'll see y'all in the